stuffed podcast. I'm re- I'm listening to oh, myself. Nice. That's nice. Um, I didn't mean to do that. Hello. Um, so today, uh, we're going to be talking about how you kind of get into coaching and how you kind of climb the the coaching ladder. Um, we're going to be talking. Yeah, perfectly scuffed. I know it's got to be. I've got to start off with the appropriate level of scuffedness. Um, otherwise, I'm going to look stupid. Um, yeah, so, oh god, I've got the chat showing as well. Look how scuffed this is. Appropriate levels of scuff chat box. I can hide that. Perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, okay, let me click off that. Oh, dude. Good, we're, we're cool. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about getting into coaching, how you progress as a coach. Uh, and uh, to joining me today, I've got Spilo. Impressive. Uh, That's imp- hello. Hello, guys. Hello. Welcome. Hello. You're, you're live to... The Green. huge crowd. Yeah. Okay, I'll switch to the other screen. Okay. Okay, cool. Hello, hello. Welcome. Um, so why didn't uh I guess we'll start start with you, Spilo. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm sure everyone knows who you are. Um but yeah, every, just... everybody, right. <clears throat> everyone here almost certainly knows who you are. Okay. Uh <laughs> there you go. So yeah. Gosh, I already see a comment about my hair. My hair is my hair so so like my scalp has been super dry, right? But it's like upstairs. I have to keep the heater on 24/7 because it's freezing. Oh my so god! So I have to like, yeah, you have to like oil it up. But the problem is, is it doesn't come out in the shower very well unless you like shampoo it like nuts. So it's like, it's 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 not it's on purpose. So no comments in <laughs> chat about it. I'm I'm going for the 1930s gangster look. Okay, so um, and I for, completely forgot what the original question was. So introduce English yourself. English Just tell me who you are. Hi. Sure. My name is Spilo, obviously. I am the head coach for Boston Uprising Academy. I have been involved in coaching for over a decade. Uh, My dad was a teacher. I grew up loving listening to him teach. And um, I got into Overwatch coaching probably around two years ago. Got streaming, live streaming VOD reviews for all the plats in the chat, like Jane, I guess you could say, but significantly (laughs) smaller time. (laughs) Yep. And then I got in a team coaching about a little over a year ago. Uh, and that was uh, something I really, really enjoyed. Extremely difficult challenge, but it was something that I loved to do in about a game I also happened to really like. So it was two of my greatest hobbies, I guess, combined. And that's where we are today. Cool. And Josh, go, you take, take the stage. Uh, I'm Josh. I'm the channel manager of HSL. I'm with HSL for like over a year now. And I make sure that everything runs smooth as possible. And before, I was on various other teams, and I also coached and played American football and uh, did a little bit of karate and Japanese jiu jitsu. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this podcast and see what the chat has to say. Yeah, so obviously, uh, just to reiterate, if anyone has any questions at any point, uh, this is supposed to be a fairly unscripted thing, so. We'll, we'll just go off script if anyone asks any interesting questions and just talk about that. Sorry, I'm just pulling my socks up. Um, and if anyone who doesn't know who I am, I'm I'm Aplox. I'm an assistant coach at HSL, and I've only been there like, what, like two months? Uh, no, not even two months. Six weeks, I guess, technically. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Fiery Panda, thanks for the follow. And, n- I can't even say your name, dude. It's all right. <laughs> I'm sure you get that a lot, Spilo, where you're just like, uh, yeah, your name, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Except a couple of times I've been baited, and they're like, oh, thank you for the follow. I'm like, I just said a racial slur, or I just said something that was yeah. extremely offensive. And I'm like, mm. so, so, so long as you don't... Cautious. Yeah, so long as you don't pronounce it, like, so long as you pronounce it how you see it, and it doesn't sound like you're trying to say something offensive, you're, um, you're yeah. probably safe. Yeah. Probably yeah. okay. So, you kind of almost started with the, um, the first question so how if you were right now with all the experience you have to say someone said you know how do i how do i get into coaching where do i start how would you how would you answer that question well i mean the first thing they have to ask is uh, thank you for the follow that everyone that you really want to do um and and obviously that question is not going to be easy to answer that's going to actually take time of actually coaching finding out if that's something that you want to do but I think coaching for me, the transition was a little bit easier than it was for some people because, like I said, that's something I had been doing for a long time outside of Overwatch. So actually getting into coaching inside of Overwatch was really just about finding out whether I really loved the game or not, not whether I loved coaching or not. So that's the first thing that I would do is 
are you the type of person that likes to teach people other things? Are you the kind of person that likes to take lead in situations? Are you do you like making other people better? Do you get a sense of like self satisfaction about seeing others improve? Um, which is in a way selfish, but also in a way unselfish because it's about other people. But you do get a sense of personal satisfaction out of it. Uh, and obviously, those are the questions that I'd always want to ask first. I think a lot of people kind of see coaching and be like, oh, that's easy. You know, it's just like you just have to know a lot about the game or know a lot about whatever you're coaching and getting into it. But it's a lot more than that. It's about being able to progress individuals uh, while you yourself are also progressing as a coach. So being able, do you enjoy working and talking and leading with other people? Are you a patient? Um, do you enjoy, again, kind of not again, not, not about just telling people what to do, but about making them better individuals? Right. And that's something that's going to take that's not easy to answer. That takes a lot of time to do. So I guess to get into coaching, um, find find a, any team, a team, any diamond, plat, gold, silver. Uh, obviously, I would probably encourage even beginner coaches to aim high when it comes to finding a new team. Uh, when I first started coaching, it was with a master's team, which I had never coached a team before. It was like high masters. And I was like, there's no way I'm good enough for these guys. But the, all, the fact of the matter, the, a lot of what you're going to be doing it's going to be more about like leadership and making people work together and things like that. So just start coaching. Is and and if you if you work a month with these guys and you and you're doing reviews and you're spending time proving them as a as a unit and you're like I hate this. I really don't <laughs> like working with these people. Or you know what? I'm tired of talking and and I don't really know how to handle these situations. And five reviews are boring and scrims are boring. Then coaching isn't for you, right? But you have to try. Uh, and you have to give it your all. Uh, and then I guess at that point, if it's something, there's always going to be ups and downs. But if it, if there's a lot of upside for you, if you are enjoying it, uh, if it's something that you you, you, you finish scrims and you, you go home and you, you take a shower and you're thinking about it, then maybe coaching is for you. But again, the big thing is, is being a people person. You don't have to be chatty Cathy, but being able to work well with people uh, and then actually trying it and seeing if you like it. You know, if you don't put the sushi in your mouth, you don't know if you're going to ever like it or not. But you actually have to take that first step into the water to actually find out if it's going to be for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about you, Josh? I know, I know you're not a coach, but as a manager, how would you? What would you say to people? Where Where would you tell them to start as a coach? I mean, because obviously you come from a coaching background, right? Outside of uh, outside of Overwatch. Mm, yeah, it's a hard question. As Bilo said, you need to be sure if you want to do that and try it out. Especially if you're coming, let's say you're a player, you think you played for too long, you want to get into coaching. One thing that you might should know is it's actually more work than an actual Way player more work has. Than you think. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like the, the reviews, uh, the sessions with the players, uh, the preparation, a lot of things that actual players or the majority of people don't see, but, but a good coach does in the background. And yeah, now just try it out. Find a team that suits you, even if it's Diamond Master whatsoever. Uh, try to learn as much as you can. Make experience. I think that's one of the most important things. Need to make experience to see what's good and what's not, and what you want to change to kind of find your style. And then, yeah, if you like it, keep going. Because Overwatch is a game, in my opinion, that needs way, way more coaches and. Well, yeah. I mean, follow, following on from that point, actually, quite closely, um, like Spilo already said, you can you can aim very high at the start, right? There are teams that are, I mean, what, 4.3k average that don't have a coach and are looking for a coach. And as someone with almost no experience, you can get onto a team almost as high as that, right? Um, do you think that's something, that's, so, yeah. do you think that's, something that's reasonable for people? So you said, where did you say you start against Speedo? Sorry, what what SR was the team uh, that you first coached? High, high, master, high Masters, and I could have gone higher, but that was just the first team that I actually, um, just the first team that I actually took and took interest in. If I had waited a week, it, I could have gone higher. Mm -hmm. How did you find that as your first, as your first team? Did you play um, Overwatch before that point? Yeah, so I I kind of, like I said, I kind of played the game. I picked up the game. I used to be a very competitive Lord of the Rings online player. Don't laugh. Um, and then my, my friend was like, stop it, you need to play an actual good game. Try this game out. I got the first person shooter, got into Overwatch, and, and I played it for a while. I did the VOD reviews after I kind of got into it because I thought that was fun. And then I set a personal goal of hitting GM, right? So I, I got right around when I first started coaching that team, I was like mid high masters, and I ended up hitting 4.1K right afterwards. But getting to finding that team was just about finding discords. I think it was like Iostux's Discord, the OW, I got an invite to that. 
the Open Division Discord. Um, I believe Jane's Discord also has some looking for team, looking for it coach does, things. Yeah. Over competitive Overwatch, maybe I can't. I can't remember all the discords that I looked around in, but I just basically was looking for a team, looking for a team, looking for a team, and then I also um, looked for teams that were looking for a coach, and yeah. um, just I was like, hey, tried out with a couple different of them, and that was that. It, it's it takes a little bit of work, but at the time, at least, it, it wasn't hard. Yeah, I don't think it is now, and I think probably even less so because there's. I mean, I I spend time looking in the recruitment posts, you know, and I see all the time people people looking for coaches. Um, it's mm. clearly something that is lacking in the community, right? I mean, and that's part part of what this this discussion is about is getting more people interested in being a coach, right? And uh, mm. hopefully sending more people down that path because there are lots of players and a a big shortage of coaches, right? The ratio is completely mm. completely off. Mm. Um, you know, teams can quite comfortably have multiple coaches, even even at lower SRs. It's it's more than reasonable to do so. So, when you started, did you think, you know, I want to be an Overwatch League coach? Like, on day one, were you like, I want to be an Overwatch League coach, or, or an Academy coach, as you are now? Was that was that your goal in mind when you first started? Yeah. yeah, that was my initial goal. I think I looked at Overwatch League, and that was always felt like a long way off, and it, it kind of was, for sure, but that was, that was the ultimate goal. I mean, I, I think I'm one of those people, and I'm sure a lot of people in chat will they'll find themselves to be the same to where I don't like just doing something. I like doing it all the way through. Um, I have a hard time with really any hobby, I guess, to take it halfway. Yeah. I like doing it as best as I can and, and finding something that I really want to do. And at that point, I was kind of at a career crossroads for me where I wasn't so sure with the job I was at that I wanted to do it. So I wanted to see if I wanted to be a full-time Overwatch coach. So I took it really seriously. And um, I'm also the firm opinion that there's a lot of carryover from coaching to coaching. Um, we were, I was talking a little bit about Josh with this before we started. Um, and so even if Overwatch League collapses next season, everything that I've learned, everything I've practiced, it had, there's a reason for it, right? And, and it will have carryover to whatever I decide to do next. So 100% Overwatch League. Um, I think Academy is, is fun, is great. But even then, it's like it's not a, it's not a full-time job in terms of like actual pay, not really yeah. for any team. So it needs to be more and it's not all about the money but i want to be able to support myself and create a future out of doing this job and that's the ultimate goal <clears throat> yeah <laughs> awkward silence 100 agree yeah. yeah i'm good at those you i can should, do another one, if you guys have... one oh no we could do them all the... we can do them all night <laughs> okay cool yeah all you right. should have a goal when you start out and it's really important even if it's like just saying yeah, one of being contenders, Overwatch League. You should aim towards that goal and try to do everything possible to make it every day a little bit closer to it. I think it's important. It yeah, sorry for interrupting. I think it's important too that, like, you have that long-term goal, but you also need to be having goals and how to get to that goal. So, like, if I want to be an Overwatch League coach, how do I actually get there? Well, I need to, you know, be good at communicating. I need to understand the meta better. I need to communicate better. I need to be able to coach a contenders team, coach an academy team, right? And so it, then you have to break that down further. Okay, well, then how do I get to know the meta better? Right. Okay. And set goals and how you're going to do that. Right. Or how do I, how do I start coaching a contenders team? How do I get to that level? And you need to break that down and set goals like that. Cause a lot of us is like, we all have that dream of I'm going to be a professional sports player. Or, I'm going to be a firefighter. Or, I'm going to be a world famous scientist and everybody has a goal. But then when you get to the nitty gritty, uh, like today, what are you like legitimately? What, if you wanted to be the world famous scientist, what are you going to do today to be the world's best scientist? Obviously you're not going to get there today, but what habits or patterns or goals are you going to set today, this week? to actually get one step closer to your goal. Uh, so it's a, I think a lot of coaches are like, oh, I want to be an Overwatch League coach, um, but they don't I really mean, know we'll what they're going to do. I probably put it on YouTube, there. I can see. And you I don't didn't have do that to with the last one. To do it. But you just need to actually be I, I can. critical. I've got the VODs downloaded. Think about what can I be doing better and set those goals to get there. It's the same as anything. It's the same as a player wanting to be an Overwatch League. How are you going to get there? How are you like? What are you going to do to get that extra 100 SR to turn yourself to 4.2 to 4.3 to where maybe some Tier 3 teams to take a look? So it's like... Um, it's just the individual goals. It's the micro goals that all have that big picture in mind, I guess. <clears throat> it really go. I mean, for me, this is. It's 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 weird sometimes having people talk about this, and uh, and you say this to people, and I don't know. Like, is this not is this not how you live your life? Is there not a reason that you're living your life? You know, do you not have in your in your in your mind in in just just living day by day? 
what am I doing this for, right? Like, what am I working towards? Otherwise, you know, you just just doing the same old crap every day, right? Like, and what's the point? What's the what's the end game? You know. Um, and it and it, that skill is something that you can apply to, to, to any problem, right? To to any goal. I want to. I want to be this person, right? I want to be an astronaut. You know, even even that as a goal is is achievable for for any real person. You just have to know how to get there, right? And be able to break it down into achievable goals, like you say, like little step by step, climb the ladder a little bit by little bit. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. So. Let's let's go into the into the coaching a little bit more. So, you know, you've started your coaching journey. You're in your first team. Um, how important would you say it is to to listen from your players, especially listen and learn from your players, um, not just at the start, but at any point in your journey. Um, to me, to me, okay. Let me let me put a good a good way of putting it. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's it's like taking customer feedback, right? So like, let's say you've got the comment box at your local business, right? And you're doing the best you can and right. And you open up the comment box and it says, Hey, your Frappuccinos are overpriced. Right. <laughs> and your first response, whenever taking criticism as a business, as an individual, uh, as, as a well. coach, not isn't Spotify. immediately to get the, it will be on SoundCloud. Uh, isn't always immediately to go, Oh, they're just wrong. But to actually think critically about it, you know, are they, or they what's our sales number on that? What's our success? Do we think it's over? Uh, this is the worst analogy ever, but you get the idea. Like it's it's about okay, think about it. Is that really fair criticism? And if you think it's a fair criticism or worth deserves more thought, give it a shot. Uh, I mean, as of the past week, I took some criticism or some suggestion from one of the players in the academy team about how we were handling uh, something within the team. I go, you know what? I think you're right. Let's try that. And you know what? It worked great. Right. So clearly I have still a lot to learn. And, and the player that the criticism came from was somebody I trust and who's a good, smart, intelligent player. And he phrased it respectfully as well. So we didn't, there was no problem at all. I don't, I'm not a perfect coach. Right. Um, so I, I think all I would say 80 percent listen to the criticism, give it a fair balance. Uh, the only exception or the little misgiving I would have is obviously as a coach, you are going to have to make decisions sometimes, especially as you, you progress at the ladder and your authority and respect with the teams you work with grows you're gonna have to make decisions that might not be popular uh, i know that i have made decisions that weren't always like well i don't know if that's the best i don't know and sometimes when you know it's the right decision and you have given the criticism fair thought and still don't think it's fair and you just have to do the best that you can and just just have to hope that your team trusts you so i think it is very important to listen and learn from players but players are fallible uh, especially if you're working with lower tier teams with younger players players are often just stupid um i'll be completely honest they're kids yes. right they don't know what's best for their own well-being most of the time um Very but true. you do but you also do need to make sure that even even the, a broken clock is right twice a day and most players are smarter than a broken clock so uh make sure that you are listening and even if you don't always follow the criticism Usually there's a root reason behind the criticism. criticism. So, for example, maybe a player is like, I don't like how we do um, uh, VOD reviews. The VOD reviews, I feel like, uh, duh, like and the, basically the problem is, is that they don't like the VOD reviews because they feel like they're too long. Okay, well, maybe you need to do long VOD reviews because there's something that you have to focus on, but maybe you could do something to make it feel less long. Maybe you could do it to make it feel more involved, make it feel less boring, less dull, so you can keep the players more involved. So maybe you don't actually follow the criticism to a T, but something in that criticism gave you an idea about, okay, this needs to be done better because players aren't really happy about that. Um, so even if the criticism isn't always exactly fair, it still gives you a chance to think about that situation and how you can make it better, if that makes it Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> you, 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 you talk these points so so fluently, Spilo. It's, it's impressive. You go down all, all, oh. the, all the alleys. <laughs> when 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 you when you make enough mistakes when you make enough mistakes you generally learn a lot so yeah well I've made many mistakes <clears throat> yeah you also need to make mistakes to to learn from it it's also really valuable mm-hmm. well no one ever no one will ever you have to make like mistakes for people to tell you what's wrong right <laughs> otherwise right, you never exactly. get better sometimes your mistakes are joining teams like a chicken contendies. <laughs> it's time that th- I just heard it was a good time to throw in some juice. But we can go on to the next question. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, so on that on on the note of ba- uh, joining bad teams, uh, this is a question that's kind of further down. 
Yeah. But I know other people have made this mistake in the past, and it's something that hits quite close, close, home, close to home for me, is this whole thing of casual teams. You know, yeah. that, that team of, you know, they're all 4.4k players, but none of them give a shit, right? Like, you do mm-hmm. a VOD review, they're all there playing comp, or, I don't know, playing Snake or whatever, I don't care. Like, they're doing some other crap, and they really couldn't care less. Um, you know, you set the goals in the scrim, you're like, okay, you know what, guys, we're going to focus on our communication today. I want to make sure that we're all listening to the target calls of so who, so-and-so, who and we're uh, following, the, like, the old track, whatever, you know? Something along those lines. Yeah. And, um... And they couldn't care less, right? They're doing their own thing. You've you've said that you want to play this particular composition on this stra- on this map, and and they're not doing that. Um, how do you avoid getting into that kind of position? Because a lot of people do, and I don't know. People for me, because I've I've met other coaches, and I'm just like, are you just not decisive enough to realise that that this is going to be an issue for you long term? Um, I mean, I think it, it, you could look at it both ways. Obviously. There's the, the you're, if you're on a team where it's like super hyper casual and it remains that way for a long time and players just continue to not care, like that's a problem. But honestly, I, I would put a lot of burden on the coach himself because honestly, the first thing is when you actually join a team is it, it's always going to be less than an optimal situation. When I'm working with an academy team now, when I'm working with any unsigned NA team, when I'm working with a signed Australian team, things are always going to be in less than optimal state. And ultimately, as a coach, you're basically have the same ladder as a player in a way of climbing up the ladder. So I think a lot of times is as a coach, when I would say, if you're a part of a player of a team that doesn't take things too seriously, well, take that as a challenge to try and encourage that team to take it seriously and improve yourself. I'm going to say the same thing to a coach. If you the very first VOD review with a team and the team isn't taking things hyper seriously or it just kind of feels lackadaisical, don't be like, ah, crap, this team is too casual. I'm going to go find a new team. No, spend a month working with those players, make them care, teach them how to care, improve yourself as a coach, take that challenge on because that is one, that's a learning lesson for you as a coach. You're not Overwatch League level yet and how to get there is by these little humps and challenges along the way. So yes, there, I, I think ultimately even the best coach, if you're playing with a hyper casual team, maybe you went over two or three of the players and they start to take things really seriously and they buy into your infectious, uh, um, uh, enthusiasm, enthusiasm right yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and you like kind of teach them how to have structured themselves better and then um but you know what you walk away from that a month later you find a new and better team and those players are going to love you to death they're going to be like that was the greatest coach like i didn't care about the game and you maybe get into it and a couple of, you're not going to reach everybody right maybe the team is really that casual but like i i think it's like as a coach you don't run away from challenges unless you legitimately cannot i've like reached a wall and you cannot improve you need to find ways to work around that challenge i mean that's been my coaching career is giving every problem my best go and not just throwing in the towel and quitting um even if it meant like a lot of uncomfortable situations and a lot of players that i just didn't like i think that's one thing that josh will back me up on whether it's football or anything else there are going to be players that you just don't like um but you need to Take it seriously enough to say, you know what? I'm going to give it the best go. Maybe I can spin this or sell this a better way. Maybe I can um, be more persuasive. Maybe I can showcase that, hey, you guys want to be the best, right? You guys want to be better. Well, this is how we're going to get better. And, and that takes time and that takes practice. And so that's a skill that's going to serve you at any level, at any tier. And I would say always err on the side if it's your fault. Because even if it's not your fault, the it's still going to get you in the proper mindset for improvement that's going to help you elsewhere. I mean, it might not be your fault, but ultimately, as the coach in the position of power, it's your responsibility, right? Yeah. doesn't yeah. matter if I've it's got your tempo- fault. Temporal in uh, chat. Sounds like you didn't have player buy-in, sell the plan better. Exactly. Again, Temporal knows that we've worked with a lot of teams and a lot of players that doesn't matter how well the plan is communicated or how well the VOD review is handled, it's, your, that it's going to go poorly. But again... The goal here isn't to always is isn't to have perfect player buy-in. The goal is to make yourself better at finding player buy-in because then you start to work with better and more and more competitive players and more and more competitive teams, and you already know how to get people to buy in because you've practiced with the the literal worst. Right? So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what's your what's your take? Yeah, on but this, Josh? Also, yeah, you go ahead. Also, the player that are really hard to handle with, with. I think it's it's a real challenge for a coach, in my opinion. It it also um, lets you think about the approach you do, if it's the right approach, 
how you can handle it better, what what so on. I think these players also like really test you, in my opinion, to make you better. Like as you said, uh, you want to improve, you want to get better, and I think every coach should have dealt with really really difficult player, in my opinion, to get better. It's like you can take so much from them, in my opinion. Uh, how you should do things, how you should shouldn't do things, and at the end of the day. If you made a little bit of an improvement, uh, you did your job and you can move on. So you can never uh, go into a team and, and expect everything and, like turns out as you would like it to be. So yeah, you need you need challenges, new challenges every day or with every new team uh, to to get better yourself. Otherwise, you you stuck at some point. Mm. Well, and ultimately, it always takes time, right? Like yes. you've, you've got to give it a good go. I mean. Uh, you join any team and I think like you say I think a month is a very safe maybe not very safe I, I think it's a very fair amount of time to say right yeah safe is completely the wrong word fair right you say I will I will stick with you for, for any anything right and it doesn't just go for like <clears throat> coaching over yeah. coach, just like, going for just, an Overwatch just team. like marriage <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah I'll stick with it for a month see if it works out um, no but like any, anything you're like you know what I want to get I want to get fit I'm going to go to the gym every day for a month and see how that works for me. I, I'm going to coach a team for, for a month and, uh, and see how that goes for me, right? And you have to give it that good go. Um, otherwise, you'll never really know whether you can overcome the challenge, right? Yep. Um, yep. It takes time. Absolutely. So Yeah, and also stick to it, right? Don't, don't give up. Just move on. It's really important. A lot of people, like, if you have a weak mindset as a coach, you should directly stop or really consider your choices that you made in my opinion it's something that really takes a lot mentally and physically in my opinion if you want to move the the coaching ladder from the bottom to the top and you have to grind and you have to keep going <clears throat> absolutely um i kind of that hops on to another point <laughs> actually i guess we could just very briefly cover it but um any any uh, quick cheats, you know? Do you, do you have the cheat codes for, for climbing the ladder? You're like, oh, you know what, I'll just uh, XX square circle and just skip straight to contenders. Anyone got anyone, <laughs> any of those, or is it really just a grind? Um, I mean, you should work efficiently. I think that's the first thing that you should do is, like, there's that science on everybody has four to six hours of intense focus every single day, right? Um, and that's why players teams usually don't do more than two or even overwatch league teams usually don't do more than two some sometimes three scrim blocks an entire day so you should t treat that like as a coach like when you're in scrims focus how can you make your team perform not perform better but learn better like what are they working on make sure the feedback is quick concise um make sure you're like put every ounce of effort you can into making your vod review as accurate as possible and then when you're done don't just turn your brain off go sit in the shower and think about what you did think about how you could have done it better think about what you're going to be doing better next time um i was talking with a coaching friend of mine earlier and how i didn't stop using sticky notes when i retired from playing competitive overwatch i kept using them but now there's coaching goals all right this week i'm working on this or this week i'm going to work on communicating this better or this week i'm going to make sure i avoid this mistake Right. And so continually like being self-critical um, of your of your progress and then challenge yourself. So I went from the masters, cruddy masters team who I was like, I made a lot of mistakes with. These guys are nice, but it was just like a masters team, you know, to chicken contendies, which won open division um, or was number one in open division and gotten to. Right. And so that was a huge jump. And yeah. I felt a little in over my head with a lot of this stuff, but. It was exactly what I needed. It was a good challenge, you know? And then from there to the, the drop bears and then from there to like, I, I didn't feel ready to join an academy team, you know? You're never gonna feel ready, but you put yourself in those instances, kind of learn on the go and you force yourself to learn. So, you know, put yourself out there, reach out to a bunch of teams. Um, I, every single off season, I was looking for a new team. I messaged every Overwatch League manager, academy manager, I think I did, I like literally can every contenders team, hey, you guys looking for a head coach, here's my stuff, like you can look into it, I will do a VOD review for free, just send me a VOD and I'll look it over, you know, whatever. Like just assume that they're gonna say yes and what's the worst thing that can happen? Say no. And boy, that really physically injured my, no, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It's, it's just, it's, it's just a no. So yeah. be, be self-critical, make sure that you're not AFK braining and like some um, contenders coaches do. <clears throat> that just sit in scrims and don't do anything from what I've heard. 
So, <clears throat> yeah. So I've heard too. Don't do that. And um, yeah. and then obviously put yourself out there. I think you have these kind of people on every tier, right? Like it's in the real world. Mm -hmm. So in the real world too. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what uh, what profession you're in. There'll always be those people that are. You you wonder how the hell they got into that position. Uh, irrespective yeah, so of what it is. I have to ask. Um, when you say you join chicken contenders and then you guys were were uh, were going straight to to contenders, uh, do you think if you could could change that to let's say to join like another OD team that was like more the average tier three team? Would you rather join them instead of chicken contenders that when you already knew, okay, they go directly to contenders just to have like a maintain uh, improvement level of yourself and your team? Um, or would you done, uh, done the exactly same thing with like, uh, so, I'll, I'll throw you into the pit and see if you yeah. survive. So it's no secret that chicken continues was a complete disaster in every single way possible. Um, <laughs> players, management, team, environment, everything. Um, oh, sorry. But... To, and obviously, I always, like I said, recommend sticking with a team as long as you possibly can to make to make the improvements. And obviously, going with a tier three team that was maybe lower down the ladder, but maybe a little bit more well balanced, would have been more beneficial for some aspects of my coaching. But in a way, I was was still a chicken continues. I think like four weeks or a month or like that. But it was, even though it wasn't a learning experience in some ways, it was a learning experience in others because I, I learned a lot from that one, the incident that happened. Um, so it was, I don't really regret it, no, because it was such an ugly incident that it like single-handedly changed how I thought about that level of play. Um, I was very self-critical about that whole in incident and I, and I learned a lot. It was like a one single traumatic experience over the instead of a series of minor little learning coaching lessons like it is with any other team. um so no I, I wouldn't change it i wouldn't change it it taught me a lot on how to handle a situation like that and how not to handle a situation like that um and it was like uh you know you, you have the you got the scar on your elbow right you you kind of wish it didn't happen but it taught you a lot right that that one accident on what not to do so yeah it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to say and then, yeah go yeah yeah. Reflect, <clears throat> reflect and move Learn on, right? Yeah. Reflect and move on. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So we've got a couple more questions in this section. So uh, I guess this, we're going to be hopping around a little bit, I guess. So what's the difference between coaching at different levels? Um. I don't know. Ha have you done much coaching? Of like, do you do much individual? You do like lots of uh, individual water reviews, right? Sweetly. I. I mean, I see them mm -hmm. on your stream all the time. Um, yes. With like lower level players as well, right? Do you you do everyone of every SR, right? You you accept? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. what would you say the difference is between say coaching? I don't know, like a gold person, someone who's a master, and then like someone who's I say contenders, right? So, I mean, first thing is the similarities would be golds and GMs need to learn how to play the game better uh, in terms of how they approach the game. Like that sounds kind of forehead, but like. A lot of times you'll see GM players that still have really bad training habits. Uh, they yeah. still sometimes. I mean, you you see it all the time in Twitter. Oh, there's bad tank players and masters are the worst. All the Moira one tricks and uh, where there's like they just it's just blame shifting, right? And that kind of crap happens at every SR. So like taking personal responsibility. What am I going to do to make myself better? Um, but the difference, I guess, between like a gold and a GM player is <clears throat> with a gold player. They need to take more time to uh, check their training habits, I would say, significantly more than a GM player. With a gold player, you're more likely to have a player that plays a lot of different heroes. With a gold player, you're more likely to have a player that spends a lot of time watching ML7 streams instead of playing competitive. Uh, with a gold player, you're probably seeing somebody who uh, doesn't do VOD reviews, doesn't self VOD reviews. With a gold player, you're probably doing, seeing someone who spends a lot of time in quick play uh, or does a lot of aim training. Um, doesn't actually play the game enough. Uh, somebody who will play three days and then take four days off, right? So they're just not as serious about the game. I mean, it's no accident that lower SR teams generally fall apart because those just players just aren't as serious, right? Yeah. So the thing with the goal players is is going over their mistakes, like a single mistake or multiple mistakes in their gameplay, finding out, all right, here's what you're going to focus on. But then I also, after the VOD review, will send them like a little Google Doc, like this is what you need to do to improve. Yeah. Three or four comp games a day to improve. Uh, you need to be 
uh, doing a self audit review once a week. You need to be writing this down and sticking it on your monitor and knowing what you're focusing on and checking your feedback and on, on whether you improved at that or not. You need to stop playing, you know, seven different heroes and I'm gonna roll Q tank today. I'm gonna Q DPS today. I'm gonna Q heals today. And you need to most importantly stop start taking responsibility for yourself. Whereas a GM player, they know they have to play the game a lot. They're going to be playing the game a lot. Um, you're less likely to see, you know, your sub GM support player, you know, spending hours upon hours upon hours playing DPS and tank on yeah. a weekend or taking four or five days off. Um, so with a goal player, it's just about more importantly, it's to focus on um, good training habits. And then with a GM player, it's about fine tuning, fine tuning those habits but then also think about the game uh, as a, at a more micro level, I guess. Mm -hmm. And as for your, so I mean, you you covered that from the player's perspective. How would how would you approach it differently as a coach? Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, honestly, I mean, it depends on whether you actually are talking about me serious, one hundred percent seriously coaching a player, or just roasting them. Yeah, yeah, screen. yeah. No, I understand. I so, mean, so let's say you're a new coach, right? You're a new coach, and uh, I don't know for some reason you decided to join that gold team instead of you know the five hundred yeah. GM teams that are offering coaching positions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you approach um, coaching the gold team as opposed to coaching the the higher level teams? And do you think it's do you think it's even relevant for people to join teams if that that low level you know do you think there's even a point so no i don't <laughs> i think i don't think you should join a team until you're diamond personally um again okay, like we said yeah. just the statistics statistics state that if you're in gold probably because you don't take the game seriously you might say but you really don't, you don't i mean you don't play it enough i, but, I, made, um, I made this I, sorry you carry on you go ahead no go ahead well go so ahead. yeah i made i made this statement and uh to, to someone and they uh, they weren't particularly happy about it but i basically said you're gold because you want to be gold essentially right you're gold because you haven't put in the effort you need to be able to climb mm. you know it isn't even about uh, like like you say setting the goals is important right but a lot of the time it's simply because you don't play enough you just don't have enough experience or practice you're not actively practicing doing the things that you need to do um, yeah uh, sometimes yeah. that is that is just it yeah, yeah it's, it's it, pretty that's rough it is. It's like you have to be pretty, like you just don't spend a lot. At least you don't spend your time efficiently in the game. Let's put it that way. Um, like you can, yeah, okay, you can sure. I can spend hours. I could spend hundreds of hours mindlessly strumming a guitar. But if I'm like not actually setting goals for myself and giving myself feedback and pushing myself outside my comfort zone, I'm not going to improve a guitar. It doesn't matter how many hours you spend at it. And that's how a lot of players, even if they have you know, plat border border gold, if they're not actually playing to improve, they're not going to get better. And so in a way, your statement is correct like if you really want to improve you will you will improve and the thing is, is a lot of people are like well i don't know how to improve well again if you really wanted to improve you would find how to improve nobody taught me how to coach overwatch i had to go teach myself right so yes uh it's easier if you know how to improve but you will find a way to improve. Like you yeah. will come to the conclusion that I need to fod review myself, or I need to be playing more consistently, or hmm, maybe playing seventeen different heroes isn't the most efficient <laughs> use of my time. Um, yeah. so coaching, I guess again, like staying on topic of the question, coaching a lower SR team, I would focus more on explaining the basics of team structure. Like, hey guys, listen, we do things called vod reviews, um, where we don't spend up hours upon hours, but we spend a decent amount of time looking over things that we need to be going better. We need to be setting goals that we could be working on. Um, we have to be playing compositions that make sense uh, and that fit our hero pools. Like it doesn't matter if it's a meta comp or not, but it's something that like, you know, you're a good widow, he's a good Hanzo, we'll play double sniper, right? And and here's how double sniper kind of works. Like take angles and things like that. And so you just basically explain the rudimentary basics. Absolutely basics. And so they walk yeah. away from that, right? And they walk away from that, even if half the team it doesn't end up climbing out of diamond, in, right? Half the team, like knows, hey, you know, teams need to have a set list of compositions that they play, and they need to have, we need to be doing VOD reviews, and and I also want to be trying to be going into scrims and be practicing things like that. So just you just explain the basic gameplay, which is communication. Like, do they know what old tracking is? Uh, do they know how to make a plan before a fight starts? Um, do they know, uh, like, like I guess it would be things like calling out cooldowns that you see. Just just the, just the very very basics. Of, of coaching and, and getting into that. And then when it when it is with a higher team, you, you kind of have to assume that a lot of that is already known. So instead of focusing on teaching what it is and how to start it, you focus on making sure that's actually happening as it happened. Because even at the Overwatch League level, um, 
planning falls apart, old tracking falls apart, yeah. execution falls apart. It's less about teaching how, what it is, but all, but actually training the skill. So it's not just the knowledge, it's actually the skill. Whereas the lower level teams, you also have to <laughs> share the knowledge because they don't know what Yeah, they're like, what's an alt track, dude? You do, exactly. you do that? It's like, oh yes, yeah, usually you do. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, so this is one I know both of you will want to answer. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we'll let Josh talk for a moment because you've been very okay. quiet, Josh. Um, how? I don't know. I enjoy it. No, me too, like dude. To Spilo, you, you know what? You're giving, you're giving me, I mean, giving all of us the knowledge. Honestly, the less, the less, jo uh, the less Josh talks, the better. Like, let's be. Honest. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay oh this. yeah. See, if I, if Unlucky, I light the Josh. fire now, he starts talking. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So, <laughs> okay, I wrote, how should you coach your approaching, uh, coaching position? So, let's say you're the head coach. Just, as, just as, as an example, how do you, how, how do you go about approaching that? Uh, what kind of attitude do you have to have to 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 do to do that? Uh, you you need to be the most reflective guy in the team, in my opinion. You need to have uh, the general plan, if you wanna say so. Uh, you basically need to delegate your whole team. Need to know what goals are we working on this week, next week. Um, see what potential problems might occur in the future, whatsoever. Working closely with your staff, keeping track of what they're doing. I think that's mo one of the most important things. Like, if you have a staff, of course. Otherwise, you work for yourself and then you can focus more on your team. Just like, I think the head coach, it's someone that keeps everything close together and tries to make the, the machine running as smooth as possible. Yeah, it's I think so. What's something that a lot of people miss, I guess, is almost. I mean, yes, you need to know a lot about Overwatch, right? But at the highest level, sometimes you are just a coach manager, right? You manage all the people it that is, can, yeah, yeah, can do their is. jobs properly I mean, and allow you to execute the vision in American for the football, team. For uh, if you're the head coach, it's you're the dictator. It's a dictatorship. What you say goes down to the to the even to the the water bottle guy. Like your word is the word of the team, so it's really important that the guy on the top, the head coach in that example. He needs to know everything in every regard and th uh, he needs like uh, you have to see it that way if the team somehow fucks up the head coach fucked up at the end and no one else in my opinion so whatever your team or your staff does it r automatically reflects towards the head coach mm -hmm. so i would agree wanna... with that to an extent uh, i'll let you finish though I'll let you finish, no no sorry. go on there you go on yeah i I, 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 th I I think that it's like, as I learned with some of my earlier teams, especially head coach is only has as much impact as he's given power. <clears throat> and when you're talking about esports, especially in lower tiers, head coach usually doesn't have absolute responsibility. So you can't give him absolute responsibility for any successes or failures. I think that becomes uh, more... I agree. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, I wasn't clear I, from the beginning. Right. I was so, like straight yeah. talking from my, my point of view and the environment right. that I try to create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like an academy, or especially an Overwatch League level, I guess it depends on the team, but most Overwatch League level head coaches have pretty much full control of just about everything. And I think that's where you have more responsibility. Same thing with an academy. Obviously, I can't decide everything, but I do have a lot more responsibility than I had with previous teams. But with my first couple of teams, I, mean, I think I had a lot less responsibility with successes or failures. I think you still have a lot of responsibility, the most responsibility out of anybody, but... I, I, I there was some teams that I've worked with and that was like it no, yeah. I can't take a lot of responsibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean you couldn't right, you couldn't even choose uh, the players on the team in the first place, right? Like yeah. right. you just join a, a roster of six people and one right. guy's utterly terrible, couldn't care less, you know. Uh he he, he doesn't turn <clears> up, <throat> he's late to half your scrims, you get ringers for half of them, you know. Um Right. That kind of thing. It's it's really hard to yeah, to feel responsible for that kind of thing, right? For me it's like for me. When I try to do a team, I always try to get the coaches first, integrate them from the start on, so they can build the environment they want to build with me together. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I try to avoid that, that you kind of lose that sort of power towards the players, since you're picking the players that you think are the best for your team. And now I'm saying that, but the reality is when we got the, the contender spot, uh, HSL bought the contender spot, but th there was already a pre-made right team. Back. I had Obviously little to drink. none. Okay, I had little to none influence whatsoever in, in the mm -hmm. decision making, even if I was the GM. And mm -hmm. yeah, at the end, it worked out pretty well. We won contenders. 
-hmm. we embarrassed ourselves a gauntlet. <laughs> yes. And then you can also come back to the yeah, what would have been if we had a coaching staff, but I don't go that far. I'm just saying um, the point is uh, try to have as much like responsibility as possible so you can do the uh, the coaching or the team environment as you want it to be because as you mentioned it early on in the beginning you said uh, most players especially the younger ones they don't know what's good for themselves and I, I fully agree um, we're as staff we're responsible to teach the players the values of being a good teammate um, investing the like making them clear that we need to invest these hours to get better especially if they have higher goals they not want to be in tier 3 or any contenders so the more power uh, I guess the head coach has the better in my opinion mm -hmm. and I, think I also it's just, it's, it's uh, just difficult it's just difficult sometimes you think because there are a lot of bad coaches out there not just oh, yeah, bad yeah. coaches but but lazy coaches and coaches that are that they don't have this experience I think when you're talking about especially American esports, I don't know how it is in Europe, but you know, it's not really a thing. Like, I mean, it is a thing, but it's much less of a thing. So a lot of the times these coaches aren't people that have a lot of experience in esports at all. It's a lot of times either ex players or people that just wanted to get into the scene. And so they don't have any experience of that at all. Um, so it's oftentimes you have like these bad coaches that don't know what they're doing. So it's hard to give power to the coach because it could be easily abused. Um, I, I, I do really like what you said, though, about building the team with the coaches first. I know that's something that I try to do specifically with Boston Academy. Um, we we did trials for a long time with the main team at Academy. And I think m the, the players that we selected, knowing that, hey, listen, the entire organization, the staff, we picked you. You weren't, oh, just the team from last year. No, we wanted you guys as players. We thought that you guys had the most potential as an academy team to become Overwatch League players eventually with development time. Um, that that instills a level of confidence, but like you said, it also has like, listen, you know, we wanted you, we picked you, you are part of our organization, not the other way around. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. I think that yeah. was a lot of my problems as a coach in my first couple of teams was, I mean, I think, actually now that I think about it, every team that I played coach for up until Uprising, I joined either early or midway through the season um, with the team already established. It was, that, it was the same for difficult. me uh, when I joined HSL uh, last in 2018 uh, in November. The academy team was already there. Um, we had the coaches and then I slowly tried to transition that into the vision that I had. Mm -hmm. And after the team, I tried to do everything from scratch for myself. Never let like uh, pre-made teams uh, dictate what we need to do. Even with the coaching staff and everything, I think as a general manager, you have the ability uh, to quality control which players, which which coaches you're getting into your team. And uh, I guess every coach that worked with me so far uh, can ensure that I make sure that the coaches do what the coaches need to do. Otherwise, I will yell at them. Or, or be nice, you know, at the, at the beginning, it's also really important to be respectful and point them out to their mistakes that you think they're doing. But at some point, you also, um, you need to, to clap on the table because at the end, you're responsible for this whole project. So, yeah, even Aplox, he can share, like, I make sure that the coaches that I pick, that, that work with, with me, uh, they, need, they need to bring something to the table. They need to invest the hours. It's really important. Otherwise, you're not part anymore of HSL. Mm -hmm. There certainly won't be any lazy coaches, I think, uh, under Josh. Um, in short, because no, like, they like, need to put it down. Well, they I, also I, here for the grind. They also want to gl climb the ladder. Yeah, and I, I feel like coaches best. are on like opposite ends of the spectrum. You have like the really, really lazy coaches, and like coaches that go like above and beyond. There's not. I feel like there's not a lot of in between. There I don't think there is. There is. You're either full ham or you're not, right? Like you either really, really want want it, or or you. Or you just don't, right? And there is no... It's a hundred or zero, you know? I really think it is like that. Um, you know, yeah. you're either going to be the absolute best you can be, uh, or you're not, right? Like, ultimately, and I think, again, I apply that philosophy to, to anything in my life. Um, you know, I'm either going to be the best I can be, or I'm, I'm not going to bother. There's no point doing it if yeah. I'm not going to be how bad you the best it, I can right? be. Yeah. You can be a coach, and you can, like... Uh, float around in tier 3 or, or your casual masters team for so long 
but at, at some point you really need to ask yourself and there there is the the the, the big goal that we talked also earlier about then you have to ask yourself okay you say to yourself i want to be contenders i want to be the overwatch league and you're still like floating around in tier three whatsoever for like a year or so and then you have to ask you the question do i actually do really the stuff that i should do yeah reflect like, reflect on I your letters, you reflect know? on yeah. it right like am i doing everything i can be doing because you see then other guys that are like there for half year and they're already in contenders and then you you probably ask yourself oh they didn't deserve it they didn't went uh, they weren't that long uh at, at my state and then yeah it's it's a lot about reflecting what you want to achieve and how much you're willing uh, to sacrifice for that mm. and the higher you go the latter the more and more you have to sacrifice in my opinion yeah it's like either if it's like uh, social connections um other activities outside of your like student life work life uh, you really have to ask your question hey man i'm at this point i think i'm doing a good job but what what do I need to do to really really make it to the next level? Is it either a time commitment? Is it my methods that are not up to pair to the coaches that are higher or at the same level than I am? And so on. Yeah, at the end it's like grinding and it's it's a lot of grinding. Yeah, it is hard work. Um so Red Games in the chat. I'm just gonna read out his message. Um so he said, I actually have three players on my masters team that want to get to contenders to slash owl. I'm also coaching my assistant coach on coaching. So he's got a coach that he's teaching and a master's team, three of which really want to take it seriously. Um, uh, he wants to coach for contenders as well. So this assistant coach also wants to progress up the ladder. I think coaching at the level would be cool, but I can't say it's a serious goal for me. Uh, do you have any recommendations to help these people advance towards these goals? So that's kind of the whole the whole point of this podcast. This assistant coach man should probably be in here listening to listening to the win- mainly the wisdom of the two people either side of me um as they've both got more experience than myself um but yeah i mean that's kind of the whole point of this podcast right i mean does anyone have anything they want to they want to say to that josh that- you want to start us off uh, i need to read the question again <laughs> it's really long basically do you have any recommendations mm-hmm. for people that are masters team or they're a new coach and they they want to climb the ladder i mean like i said this podcast is about coaches that want to climb the ladder right so everything we say here tonight is about our perspective on how do you climb the ladder as a coach right and how do you start as a coach i mean like like i said aim high i guess that would be the big thing aim high and try out for as many teams as you possibly can consume as much content as you possibly can the replay viewer is a gold mine of resource now um for up and coming coaches even Overwatch League itself is a gold mine for Overwatch uh, wannabe coaches. Just take the time to study it. Take the time to improve your own game knowledge. There's some hundreds and hundreds of VOD reviews out there on YouTube. Um, I have watched probably every single one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really no shortcuts, but like you, you can you can get there. You just have to like you have to actually put yourself out there. That's all. Yeah, hundred percent agree with the content part. Consume as much as you can, especially, in my opinion, something that is really underrated, especially for the coaches. It's literature about already existing coaches that did, that, that walk the walk. It's, it's, it doesn't matter if, if it's like um, famous NBA coaches, NFL coaches, MLB coaches, just to see their point of view, what they're doing on a daily and trying to see if there, there's something for you that, that, works for you or your team kind of get their point of view what they're doing how they got that successful winning championships whatsoever and trying to uh, replicate it or giving your own twist to it in my opinion and then yeah uh, also a thing that i can um, recommend is talking with other coaches see what they're doing how they're approaching the game and uh, what they're doing with their teams and yeah, exchange ideas, talk a lot with them. Mm-hmm. And even if, like, for example, I'm sure if you guys would write Spillo or Aplox a question about uh, a specific coaching situation, I'm more they're probably more than willing to give you an answer if they have, like, a spare five minutes. I think we and both think have a lot of... channels in our Discord specifically designed for that end, right? Uh, yeah, people have and I think a lot of, of high-tier coaches, uh, they're more than happy to answer basic i would say yeah 
basically. I mean, I love talking about coaching. So yeah. Yeah. We so wouldn't be here otherwise. Don't be afraid to, to reach out to people that you think they're doing a great job when it comes down to coaching. Uh, the worst thing they can say is, hey, sorry, I got no time or I'm not interested. And then ask another one. Yeah. We're and living in the golden age of internet. Use it. It's like two clicks away and you can message uh, Krusty from San Francisco Shock. I mean, you could, right? You can, you can message whoever yeah, you, you want. Um, Back in the days, if you want to message uh, or reach out to, I don't know, a famous soccer or a football coach, you would have to write a letter and then waiting for a reply and so on and so on. So use the golden age of internet and make it a tool for yourself. Yeah. Um, so Aki got right said, do I just message contenders teams if I want to get up to that level? I shouldn't yep. just wait around, right? I'm a tier three level coach, oh. that's an analyst, and I want to climb up the coaching ladder. Yep. Yeah. That's it. I mean, that's that's, that's how I have that's how I got where I am. I miss, I I just messaged Josh, right? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's obviously you have to have the competence to back it up. But if you think that you're competent, if you think, well, actually, screw it. If you want it bad enough, then yes, you might not be competent enough, but you the competence will come <laughs> with the experience. You yeah. know. So, like I said, be self-critical. Like, keep your own improvement schedule as a coach. Like how you're handling bot reviews, your game knowledge, your communication. Like Josh was saying, read the books. Know how other coaches handle things and then just ask, man. Like I, I said before, I have literally messaged dozens of contenders. I messaged, when I picked chicken contendies, I literally messaged, I think, 20, no, it was 28, 28 tier three teams. Wow. Individually to get a tryout. And I ended up, you know what? I tried out with all of them. Not all of them, like 15 of them. And I ended up getting offers from like nine of them. And I picked the best one out of them. You know, the highest strength one, the one I wanted the ones. Yeah. And there's a lot of teams out there that really could use the help. And if you're looking to get into contenders, you know, find a team that's in trials. Find a team that think has a possibility to get a trials. There uh, are a message every tier two team that you possibly can, especially in off season. Be like, hey, this is I'm an analyst. I could do an analysis of one of your VODs. Send me a VOD, I'll do analysis. Don't be like, can I have an analysis? Be like, listen, hi, I'm going to trial for you guys. Can you guys send me a VOD that I'll analyze for free and you guys let me know if I'm crap or not? That's yeah, it. exactly. I like That's that. all I did. I remember I, I trialed for a couple EU contenders teams um, and I legitimately messaged him and was like, this was before Uprising. And I was like, hey, listen, uh, I'm going to go ahead and analyze one of your scrim VODs. So just send me a scrim VOD. I'll do a free analysis and you guys can, uh, if you guys want to trial me or not. And one of them sent me the vibe, be like, oh, I'm not sure if we get, we have a spot for a head coach or not. And I did the analysis anyway. Turns out they didn't have the spot. But you know what? It was good practice, and it ended up finding a team that was open. Yeah. I think, uh, to put it in the words of Gary V, maybe some of you know him, maybe not. He's, like, really big into social media. And he says, if you don't communicate on social media, do you even exist? And I think it's 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 a really interesting statement that he makes. Like, if you don't communicate, if you don't go out, uh, try to talk with other people, get your name out, are you even there? Like, how can people even even see that there's a coach looking for these positions? Mm -hmm. And yeah, just just Absolutely message right. people. It's it's that simple. I, I messaged before I found the spot with Boston. I was messaging Overwatch League teams, being like, "Hey guys, I'm assuming that you guys are making an academy team next season, so I want to put myself out there as the head coach. Here's my rep." And most of them are like, "What are you talking about? Like, we're not taking an academy team, you know?" But you know what? You <laughs> never know. You never know. So I was like, I, I have zero shame. I want this bad enough. So you give it, give it a go, right? Okay, give it a go. Red games again. Uh, another thing I deal <laughs> with is that I'm a gold player but I coach low GM sometimes. I usually didn't have issues because I let my coaching speak for itself. However, I do have to deal with butt heads that can't see past my SR, but these are almost never the people I'm coaching, but outside observers. Um, it's an interesting I point. Mean, uh, that's the, so, so why do you care? If it's not the people you're coaching, why do you care? That's like people going on the internet and being like, oh, you work for Huck, Boston organization, those guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know. Yeah. yeah. And they've they got they've got no insight, right? They they've got no clue There's what they're no talking insight. about. So it's yeah. like, why do you care about that? Now, if you're actually working with a team or players that are questioning like your SR, I know the first team I actually work with actually asked my SR, which is fine. Um, just understand that like the more you coach, the more teams that you coach, the less that's going to cause issues because you'll build up. Oh no, I coach this tier three team, or I coach with this masters team, and here's here's a video I took of me coaching this team, and so eventually the SR matters the master lesson. Like. 
it's an issue at the beginning because you're probably working with crappy teams, but the more you work, the better you're going to get and the less your SR is going to be. Ultimately, they're teams that don't know what matters in a coach, right? It's as simple yeah, as that. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, yes, yeah. it can it can be an advantage at points, but it doesn't automatically mean you'll be a bad coach, right? Like, absolutely SR, not. It does, doesn't matter at all. I am actually, if I do say so myself, fairly good at coaching micro for most heroes at a contenders level, academy level. Um, but I learned nothing about micro outside of a couple of little zen tricks when i climbed when you played platinum yeah to 4.1k yeah yeah i learned nothing like i i i, I did that was more like a personal goal just to say i did it but i, I learned almost i would have efficient more efficiently spent my time if i'd actually just focused on coaching yeah sure it doesn't, it doesn't matter it doesn't okay. matter at all <clears throat> yeah because coaching it's it's not playing right yeah and you don't even need and a lot of people are like oh you need to be a good mic for a micro coach you'd be like nope don't need to be a good micro coach talk with other high sr players i can coach like academy level widowmaker and i couldn't i'm platinum widow at best right it doesn't yeah. matter uh, i think he has a follow-up statement because they try to undermine my coaching messaging my players i can tell you just give single fucks if you're confident yeah. in your coaching if your team is confident in their co in your coaching then you shouldn't worry at all yeah. let them speak don't give a single fuck about them. Do your thing. Move yeah. on. That's simple. I, as a coach, you, you kind of need a little bit of a thick skin. And there are always people that try to undermine you yeah. on your way. There'll like, always be someone that will come fuck. in. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I'm sure people can say this too. Like, you come in, you're doing a photo review, and someone's like, you're an idiot. You're trash. And you just, who cares? You've got no idea what you're talking about, you know? Yeah, uh, sometimes people say in my stream, hey, you're not the most handsome person in the world. I'm just like, you know what? I don't have time for that negativity. So. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Just, I can't just people lying to me. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Just focus on the things that matter, right? Instead of. Like, you don't have you don't have time to worry about what other people think about you in in well not in yeah. that sense, right? Uh, you. I mean, ultimately, you have to prove yourself <laughs> with with your results and your your there's players a, getting better, right? But <clears throat> there's a difference between criticism and like garbage. Yeah, you're bad. That's okay. not criticism. Right? It's like, <laughs> right. Uh, no, you're bad because your VOD reviews are too long. I mean, ultimately, that's a fair criticism, right? Like, that is actually something actionable. You can, okay, mm -hmm. why? Why is that a problem? And you can analyze right. that. But if someone's just like, you're bad because you're low SR, they don't know what they're talking about. So, how, how in the first place, did you define your coaching style? Do, and do you think this is a thing? Because, uh, particularly you, Spilo, you're quite well known for your the your coaching style the way that you present your fodder reviews right um how, how did you come to be like that and uh i guess what's your take on that kind of whole topic i mean <clears throat> if i'm gonna be honest it had nothing to do with what i thought would be an effective coaching so do you think it's entertaining uh, right i mean you've said oh, you do it's, say it's, that it's specifically i mean i think obviously that i am not certainly not a 180 from that when it comes to actually seriously coaching i've always thought myself to be a tough love coach and that was with Overwatch. That was with MMA. That's what I work with kids. Like I would ha like get in the kids' case, but they know I love them. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah, and I'll yeah, make yeah. a joke a second later. And so it's like no, 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 no. And they think it's hilarious, but then they listen, right? And they do it. You know, mm. I'm I, sl I slam my desk when I'm you know I'm coaching teams, but I'm not hollering and insulting and like not at all. It's like it it comes down to just the presentations when it comes to streaming and just having a good time for me and for stream. But when it comes to like actual coaching style, yeah, of course there's coaching styles. I mean, you there there are there are very management hands off style of coaching styles like that they just want to like make sure that everything's being done properly. There's very hands on, um, there's very intense, there's very more like lackadaisical. And I don't think there's really any one way that's the best way to coach. I think it comes down to like what's your personality. Um, I do think that more bless me for saying this alpha style. Coaches are generally better head coaches. So the loud mouths, the obnoxious big heads are generally better head coaches, right? Because there's like that leadership in there. But even then, that doesn't off automatically mean just because you have a big mouth that you're going to be a good head coach. So for me, I guess my coaching style is more of um, I demand focus, right? I demand effort. Um, but I'm like, I, I'm all about making like my emphasis is a lot on making sure that there's learning happening and that we're not just AFKing in the brain. That that's it's that you must focus. You must give it everything you've got in your scrimmage. You must 
Um, I'm not egotistical when it comes to my game knowledge. I'm not egotistical like you do it my way or the highway with what composition we're running. But I don't care what it is, but it better be you better be darn well focusing on it. Um, and you better be giving me your best effort. And that's, I guess, not exactly a style. It's so hard to define a style exactly. But I'm definitely I'm pretty heavy handed, pretty hands on. Um, I'm not one of those coaches that just sits silently an entire scrim block uh, or only focuses on a little bit of feedback in between blocks. If I see something that's dreadfully wrong in terms of like You'll what players are focusing on, I will interrupt a scrim. I've, I will gladly type pause in the middle of a match chat. Just, just you know, give her, like, make people mentally reset. Stop, stop what you're doing. Stop, stop, stop. Fix it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, no point wasting. Exactly. I mean, there's no point wasting your time, right? There's no point wasting yeah, your and their time doing something right. that's uh, completely right. wrong. But that being said, that being said, it, it, I, I, it's not the mistakes that I guess I get hard on. It's the it's it's when something is being oh, done. Thanks for the thanks for the bits, Jeff. Because everybody's gonna make mistakes, but it needs to be, uh, it needs to be fixed. <clears throat> for sure. I don't know. It, it's really it's really hard to exactly have a define a. It's, it's a style really difficult sports. question, right? Because I mean, some people are like. Like you say, like the tough love kind of style. Um, some people that are more about. I don't know. Like for me, because I'm 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 the same, right? I don't see another way of doing this. You you got to be if you're ultimately telling people what to do. You uh, that you have to be in a position of like authority, right? And you have to behave in a way that maintains that power dynamic, right? You are you are the coach. They are the player, and there is yeah. still that. I mean, it's it's maybe hard to say it sometimes, but I mean, there is that boundary, right? There, mm -hmm. there is that that difference in the way that you should behave. Um, okay. Uh, Coffee Man says, surely being an ex player helps with the coaching part by a lot. Um, and being a coach who is low tier or low elo, you have to put in much more work. Uh, Only in the sense that you start with some like game knowledge from the first place, right? But not yeah, necessarily. I mean, not necessarily. Like that that's such a that's like a that's such a fallacy though. That's like saying a player that spent five years playing a year like American football has an advantage over somebody who's not done anything for those five years related to football and is just now getting started with coaching football. Like what's gonna be more beneficial? Spending five years playing or spending five years coaching if you're looking to be a coach? Coaching. Now, obviously, if you have a background doing something related to that topic, then yeah, you're going to have an easier time coaching it. But it doesn't mean it doesn't mean like being an ex player is an advantage. Spending time in the game is an advantage, whether that's playing or coaching. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly my perspective on it too, right? Because it's just more time in the game. All, all, all it means is someone who's come to, come in and never played Overwatch and they're gold because they've like you know they've played very little Overwatch and you're a platinum border top 500 every season chances are you've just got more experience in the game right and hence yeah you know you're going to be uh, you just have more experience so ultimately you're only better because of that fact uh, not mm -hmm. because you were a player right you know mm -hmm. what old economy is you know what positioning is and stuff like that that somebody because could I, have I experience partially agree yeah, I would say I would say that's a as an ex player, even if it's like Overwatch contenders, like your cars of getting into a good coaching position from the start on, I would say it's it's nowadays easier and we see that trend more and more. Look look for example Lil Bo got a system coach defiant. Uh Ascoft. 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 With HSL. Um ex player retired, bomb assistant smart coach dude. in Boston. Very yeah, smart yes. guy. And then um you have Barney from Overwatch League who's also now an assistant coach. So there's definitely a trend that more and more ex players are turning into coaches to like mm -hmm. um, extend their their esports career. Mm -hmm. But I, I I think it's also important to mention that not every player has the potential to be a coach. You already have to have certain traits and gifts that that that, that allows you to kind of jump <clears throat> directly into the highest level mm -hmm. into coaching. So it doesn't mean okay you're an ex Overwatch League player now you you can coach. <clears throat> That's, oh, no. that's not what I want to say, but there's more and more the trend, right? Like like in traditional sports too, where where ex players they have an easier time to get into coaching. But they spent lots of time around good coaches. If you're a good player, then you spent lots of time around good coaches most of yeah. the time, right? Um, or in the case of HSL, never having had a coach, someone had to fill that role. I just think um, it's a passion. You know, you like to talk about the game, you like to coach, you like working with players. Again, I think. 
you don't have being a good player doesn't mean you're going to be a good coach. But if you, if you again, you spent time immersed in the competitive scene, you know a lot about the medicine, and and you just also happen to enjoy coaching, then that's obviously going to be a benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this and this is well. Okay. Let's start with Kara's question first, and I'll move on to one that kind of follows this. So Kara said, um, "How much of a factor is age in deciding whether you should be head or assistant coach?" Asking as a sixteen-year-old. So how much do you think age is a factor? I'm not going to lie. It has a definite factor. Um, I mean, I I know Saint was talks like over in the coaching classroom has spent time as a head coach being like a 15, 16 year old kid, but it has a factor. And even, even if you were like, nobody knew your age, still being older gives you more confidence, right? Um, age also implies doesn't always mean but it implies more experience with working with people with being in it like like before again before i got an overwatch i've had years of experience with coaching other so a lot of that did carry over a little bit um whether it should decide whether you should be a head or assistant coach i mean obviously an assistant coach is i mean you probably already knew the answer to this question before you even asked it probably means better assistant coach because it's not something you have to take a lot of an authority with but it doesn't mean you can't be a head coach. It just means it's going to be harder, right? I'm older than Krusty. Does anyone think that seriously that Krusty is a worse coach than I am? Probably, probably not, right? He being, you know, San Francisco shock and all. Um, so I think age is beneficial, but it's not should be seen as a limiting factor exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we're all on the same page as that. Is that a lot of the time it's diff- It's just hard to be a head coach if you're younger than all your players right because they don't look oh, up yeah. to you in the same way you don't demand the same level of authority and you probably don't have the same level of experience in a leadership role in general right i mean you're just a kid in school how many times have you led like a project that's you know d- to do something right like a, i know a research project or an engineering project you know like if you come in from the real world uh, you're much more likely to have had experience in leadership in general yeah being older is 100 percent beneficial especially as a head coach as an assistant coach i couldn't care less if you're like 15 16 as long as you're doing your job good but as soon as you're like leading a team making sure everything functions i I tend to pick older coaches in my opinion like it's something for me that older people they have more life experience they I don't know. It's it's most like something like a gut feeling, you know. I've, I I know they will do a better job than a sixteen year old head coach because they can handle the pressure more. They most likely have more experience in life and even with coaching before. So for me, I prefer like an older coach as a head coach always uh, above the the sixteen year old guy. Sure. Um... So this question kind of like follows it. Do you, if you're if you're a coach, do you know if you're better as an assistant coach or as a, as a head coach? Um, so that was something we put down. I think we kind of answered that question, right? It's about authority. The head coach is the head coach, right? They ultimately they are the person that should be the most senior, the most authoritative person within the organization outside of the general manager. Um, and thus, you have to demand that level of respect that and have the leadership qualities that that are required for being a head coach, right? And if you don't have those things, um, then you're probably more suited to being an assistant coach. Yeah, it's also the pressure, right? Like, if oh, I like the lighting now. Well, I like the I like the nighttime lighting, Spilo. Uh, <laughs> as soon as as things doesn't go that well, you're responsible to make sure things going well again. Whatever you do, uh, and this boils always down to experience and, and to have that. The older you get, the more experience you have. It's it's basically that simple. At least from my point of view. I don't know if you Aplox and, and Spalo if you agree with that, but for uh, me, thank you it's, for the follow, it's it's beneficial to have as, as at least a head coach that is older. I'm not saying uh, he has to be like like 25, 30 whatsoever, I, but you know at least uh, a legally adult. It's, I mean, I also just like hollering at people and telling them what to do. <laughs> you know, I I mean, I like taking lead of a situation. You know, I've always been like that. I've always kind of been like, all right, let's 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 make a plan. Let's make something happen, right? Like, here we go, guys. We're gonna get things together. And so that kind of fits the head coach archetype a little bit more. Whereas there's a lot of people out there that they, if you, where, where's the 95 million different Widowmaker positions on Numbani, Walter? They're going to tell you, right? Or they're going to be the guy that can run the Excel spreadsheet and tell you your map, 
right? Um, or they're the guy that's going to tell you, okay, which composition beats which composition on which map and why, right? Because they've spent a lot of extra hours watching Overwatch League, right? And they might not be the most communicative, like big leadership, big shot in campus. They might not be the best at handling interpersonal problems. They might not be the best person at knowing how to lead a VOD review, but they know a lot about the game of Overwatch. That's from a sport, macro, micro, analytics, something about that. And those are tools. Um, like, obviously, they're people, but like that that's like, as an assistant coach, you, you are essentially a tool for the head coach. That's what you are. Um, you are like, this, if there's a gap in knowledge, if there's something, that, a problem that you're solving, that's your job. Your job is to fix that problem. So if you're the guy that likes to take lead of things and um, you know you like to make a good system, you like to solve problems, you like to be taking leadership, you like taking a lot of the responsibility for things, head coach is probably for you. But if you're just the like studying the game, um, probably more of an assistant coach. Now you you can do both. You know I I, I personally like taking a lot of responsibility with some of the meta analysis. Um, I don't do a lot of micro stuff as much, but I do all the one-on-one VOD reviews. I do a lot of yeah, macro coaching and stuff like that, but I couldn't do it without Noxious, who's my current assistant coach. Like he fills in all the gaps. If I don't know an answer to the question, Noxious will know the answer. I guarantee it. And that's been the case with any good strategic coach or assistant coach that I've worked with. Is they will know the answers. They'll fill the gaps in my knowledge. And that allows me to better focus on things that are more important for my time. Because I know if I don't know the answer to the question, some uh, somebody that's more qualified than I will know it. And that's usually the assistant coach. To me, assistant coach isn't an assistant uh, in terms of like, oh, I need help taking out the trash. They're like, I can't do this. Can you do this? And the assistant coach will do that. I mean, you only have so much time in a day to do stuff, right? And yeah. splitting right. that load... Uh, is much easier when there's someone else to, yeah, to, it, it to split that load with you, right? Yeah. And, 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 and I, obviously I can't leak stuff here, but working with a little bit of the Boston Uprising as well and seeing how they handle things, like they have a phenomenal coaching staff, right? Um, and, and seeing like um, Ilka and Ascoft and, and Mineral and, and have many, and seeing all those guys work together, like that, the amount of Lisa, knowledge that's following. shared between those guys and obviously Mineral kind of takes that all together and provides direction with it. Like, that's really cool to see. And there's no way that Mineral could do that by himself like he did with Mayhem. You know, like he gets all the help from all those big brain, the smart guys that have studied all these different aspects or have considered all these different counter comps or like, what if we tried this? And he has all these educated opinions and he can sort that out. Uh, and that's kind of like where the assistant coach is, is so, so very useful. <clears throat> um, specifically to you, Josh, Temporal says, what does Josh think of the assistant coach that it does? First of all, the question is, uh, what's your special uh, special, special skill set as an assistant coach? Are you more versatile in, in the micro part or the macro part? Do you like to scout? <laughs> <laughs> like, mm. it's it's such a such a like open question. I mean, whatever your head coach tells you to do, you do it. Simple as that. But if he needs <laughs> if he needs help, if he needs help into scouting an opponent or or. Um, let's say, um, setups for, for specific hybrid maps whatsoever, uh, then your assistant coach will do it if your head coach is asking that. Or do it together with the head coach. Or like, as, as we discussed earlier, uh, the head coach, he's there to setting the goals and what to do especially. And then the assistant coach, they share the, the goals together with each other and fulfill them. Absolutely, and I think I think kind of like Spilo said before as well. I think a lot of people, um, you've got to find your specialist skill set. You know, find out like what 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 particular aspect are you really really good at in Overwatch? Whether it be macro, whether it be like learning new metas, whether it be uh, doing one on ones, um, whatever it is, uh, there will be something that you're better at than than the others. Right? And what you enjoy. Yeah. And, and, what, you and what you enjoy, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's the big thing too, because like it's a really easy to be good at something that you love doing. Like you could be the most socially awkward person in the world, but you really love the head coach. You will ma you will learn how to do it. I guarantee you. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I completely agree. Um, yeah, maybe Temple wants to go a little bit deeper into the question. If he wants a follow up on that, otherwise, yeah, it's such a big open question. Can't the wait. Easy answer, whatever your your head coach is, is saying. Mm-hmm. Are we getting your face cam next uh, next stream, Josh? Is that the plan? Yeah, I plan to buy a face cam with like I don't know, there are like this Logitech one with with the ring on it. With the, the ring, oh, okay. Lights, since I have 
Oh, one with so like a built-in a built-in room. light on it. Oh, fancy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Almost oh. like a like a smartphone flashlight. I hope I don't get blind. I like the <laughs> idea, but the the terrible thing is, is I don't know how how the hell do I avoid reflections on my glasses? I kind of had to look like awkwardly at my screen to avoid getting reflections in the glasses. I'll have to figure Fair out one enough. one day if I'm ever ever not doing a scuff podcast and it's a, an unscuffed podcast, then um. I might have to figure out. Electric glasses out that. that reflect less. To be fair. Sorry. There are glasses out that reflect less oh, light. Like special sunglasses. Yeah. I just wear sunglasses. Not sunglasses. I mean, street. reading glasses. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I mean, I could just buy contact lenses. I guess that's another option. Yeah, or next time you wear sunglasses. Or you could just turn off your camera so we don't have to see you. What do you What do you think, Chat? Oh yeah, I could do that. I think I can. <laughs> wait, I can find the box for that. It's down here somewhere. Uh... Man. Yeah, as uh, like oh, you yeah. talked about um, the Boston better, Uprising better. and their coaching staff, since they have like that many coaches, mm -hmm. do we think overall uh, with that uh, many predictions that people say, yeah, Boston Uprising, they're probably on the lower end of the power rankings? Uh, okay, for thanks for the follow. With your hand. little insight, do you think Boston Uprising they will be a playoff team or will be mid pack team or mm. like, at least rising? Asking the, the important yeah. questions, Josh. So I, I think that Boston Uprising is the mirror of their little academy team. In other words, they have immense potential with a, it's not a gamble. It, it's it's a, they, they picked a lot of players. I mean, like you can see how many contenders players that they picked and how many contenders, ex-contenders players are on those rosters. It's like have most contenders players. It's like what they basically have, um, which means that you have a lot of players that clearly that did well in their trialing process and they looked really good and they liked their attitude. And at this point, it's going to be about taking all those specific pieces that looked really good and making it a unit. Um, so I don't think anybody's surprised that Boston Uprising loses to the New York Excelsior. I think I was actually surprised at how well they did. Um, but yeah, you do have a team that has an immense potential and you have a very, very competent coaching staff. Um, and the way the organization is run down there, it's great. The guys love each other. Like, obviously, I'm, we have our own, like, little academy section, training section. But those guys, they have a great time down there. So, like, hearing from the next fall, like, somebody's dying laughing over something. The whole team is cracking up. So, I think this team has the potential to, like, gel really well. Um, they have a really, really good system of coaching. So, I, th I think this team has the potential to be to be, to be be really um, is it Is it going to be juggernaut? Probably not. Um, but it has the potential to surprise, I think, a lot of people. I definitely think. And there's so much work being put into that organization as well. Uh, okay, Vod said, do you, do you get the chance to interact with Mineral very much? Mm. Um, not as much. I mean, both head coaches are pretty set on doing their own thing, working really hard on our own things. Like, we all have, both have our own separate problems to solve. Like, when I'm at the facility, I'm generally working really hard at what I want to do. Yeah, uh, I know that occasionally I'm allowed to like when I have time to be able to interact with like some reviews and I've sat in on a couple of scrims. Um, there's some concerns like I can't sit on on scrims where they're playing other North American contenders teams. Just I don't oh think yeah, they're... okay, of course, Being yes, yeah, just to be respectful, that would seem kind of cheap. Um, yeah. But I could sit in on reviews. I've had discussions with them. I've been able to sit on a couple of scrims. A lot of it right now is difficult because their scrim schedule is very conflicting. Like I'm, we're already scrimming when they're starting their day, basically because yes. they're, they're on an A time that we're on EU. Um, but yeah, I, I have I have interaction with Mineral, and they're always very supportive. They want to make sure that we're a part of the organization, part of the team, um, as much as they can. I know Boston gets a lot of a lot of flack for a lot of stuff, but I've really enjoyed my. Have you have you learned anything from Mineral? Yes, yes. I think uh, when you're two head coaches working together, um, I will sit in a review, and half of it is criticizing mentally, like what he could be doing better, and like learning from his mistakes. I think I think this could be done better here, but the vast majority, like wow, like the, all this all this insight that they have. Um, I mean, I, I knew Mineral before he was with Boston. He was uh, somebody that I talked a lot with. Um, and Discord, uh, I had him featured on my stream back in the day. We did some owl analysis together. I have immense respect for his game knowledge. Um, he's actually so eloquent, which is another underestimated aspect of a head coach, is being able to communicate your ideas very clearly, 
to the point where I legitimately I didn't know at first, and a lot of people don't know at first that he was even from Europe in the first place. I thought he was American. I thought he, that his English was just 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 so like perfect, like offhandedly. I think he spent time as a sports writer, which probably helps a lot with that. But I have a lot of respect for him. Mineral is a very hardworking guy. Works harder than about any coach I know. Um, he's extremely knowledgeable about the game and. Being able to watch him do like the reviews of the team is great. Awesome. Um, I guess kind of follow, kind of following on that. So, what kind of uh, even now? I guess this is this is. Uh, I'd be interested to know the the answer to this. What kind of content do you consume to improve yourself as a coach? Um, other than maybe like the obvious stuff, like watching the Owl games, watching the other contenders games. Um, I mean, I've had to grow a little bit more picky. So back in the day when I first got into coaching, um literally everything i was watching um uh, stylosa you know like i watched yeah. everything i watched jane stylosa i think iostex was a great resource for me for a little while yeah um i i think recently i've been appreciative of mr natter over at third impact he does some streams he does some pretty solid analysis i think um i watched Every podcast involving any contenders coach that I could find made uh, Curry Shot was in some podcast. I looked at that just anything I could find. Um, but honestly, like if I was to be honest, at this point in the game, the most valuable time spent is just an overall. Yes, and just watching that right now. And it's not even necessarily because they do things perfectly; they are sloppy as anything, but. It, I found at this point in the time, just analyzing the game itself, whether that's through POVs, uh, content like uh, third persons of our scrims, or just Overwatch League is the most value. Because I'm watching another Plat Widow VOD review from some guys, not not it's as not valuable. Not helpful as it anymore. That being yeah. said, for the majority of people, that is something that that's where I would start. Is legitimately any VOD review they can get on YouTube. I've watched literally hundreds of them, um, thousands of hours. I've been spent listening to those <clears> things. So I would really, really, really encourage you to start there. But once you kind of get to the level to where you have a very strong baseline is you have to be a little bit pickier because um, it's easy to kind of AFK <laughs> mentally listening to that stuff because you know 99.9% .9 of it. So it's better, more efficient use of your time to kind of challenge yourself with what you're listening to and what you're learning. Even if it's just like you'll learn more spending an hour really studying uh, Overwatch League, then you will listening to four VOD reviews back to back to back at at, at a certain point. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, something I really enjoy actually just watching, just going into the replay view and just hopping into someone's pov and thinking, why do they make this decision? Uh, like just on repeat, you know. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly um insightful to to be able to do mm -hmm. that. The replay viewer is, like you say, probably the best tool that they could have ever brought to to Overwatch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do you balance life and Overwatch? And how did you do that before? I mean, particularly before being on the Academy team and having, a, a, I guess, a home, you know, like doing it, what is tech, like almost full time, right? Oh, what is technically full time? Yeah, it was rough. I mean, I was an MMA coach. That didn't go away when I started coaching Overwatch. That was just basically Overwatch took up my free time. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and being married as well, that was difficult. You know, my wife is very supportive and kind of a part of everything I do. She takes, like, she literally started playing Overwatch because I got into coaching it. Um, she got the Plat and Widowmaker. So Widow and Ash, two, two tricks. What a weirdo. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. So so obviously balancing life in Overwatch is really hard. You have to be really disciplined. You've got to be like, you know, what can I cut out? Do I really need to be on Reddit right now? Do I really need to be... I don't play, like, people are like, oh, you're going to play video games? I don't play video games. I'll do some FFA, but I don't. I didn't play Overwatch. I didn't have time to play. I'm too busy coaching. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me was the two and a half three months i was working with sydney drop bears so that was uh getting up at about three o'clock in the morning oh that's um, terrible for na yeah yeah coaching until around nine um and then going to sleep until around two getting up eating lunch leaving teaching mma coming back at like eight and then eating going to bed and getting up at two or three um and so that was that was rough and to point to where I, I couldn't do it after three months i had to resign after that one season and the, the sacrifices you make to pursue the dream right i mean people have to yeah, realize yeah. what it's about yeah um, and 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 you have to love it and you have to like it that being said please 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 make sure that you're taking care of yourself dietary wise please make sure that you're getting enough sleep like even when i was with sydney i was struggling in terms of energy levels but i was not getting less than six or seven hours of sleep. 
can't do that. It's not healthy. Like you have to think long term. You know, Overwatch might not still be here, but esports will. You know, mm-hmm. and anything else that you want to pursue as a coach will still be here. There will still be coaching opportunities for something that you like after Overwatch. So it doesn't have to be like make like drive yourself push yourself but not to the point where you are sacrificing your your well-being because it nothing is worth that nothing that i I promise it's not worth it's not worth it to get to overwatch league only to have yourself have a you know a psychological or a physiological breakdown it's not worth it um and and the big thing too is it's you might think that oh i can work off of three hours of sleep no you can't your coaching is gonna be crap i guarantee you you're gonna have no clue yet Yeah, you're gonna. Yeah. It's, it requires focus. It requires energy, and you needed to take care of yourself to do that. So even in the darkest of days, I still was forcing myself. You will take care of yourself because your coaching will suffer otherwise. So yeah, yeah I think that's a, that's a, a thing we also teach the players, right? To take care yes. of themselves. Getting an longevity is important. Like burnout is. As a coach, you should eat the right shit. The sleep as sleep. All you need to, you know. Yeah. yeah, and even even if you don't go to the gym and just use ten twenty minutes in your in your room or living room, dude, go for a walk. Yeah, go for yeah. A, go for a fifteen minute, fifteen half a half an hour, like half an hour in a day, going for a walk. Yes, uh, it makes Scaling, so yeah, much setting, difference. Setting, setting, there's somebody in chat says set an example for the players. Exactly. Like yeah. right now, yeah. I'm I'm literally Greek god physique. You just like okay. get... I, could, I could keep a straight face. <laughs> um, no, no, but like, I don't know. I'm I do pretty. That. I'm pretty jealous having to look at you through the camera. I'll be honest. No, but but I, I work really hard at that kind of stuff, and it's I think it is important. You want to set an example for the players. You tell the players, you know, you need to take care of yourself. You need to go to bed on time. Well, are you doing? You yeah. Know? Like I I I I even think like I mean I'm not exactly in a position to criticize this, but if Josh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You read all these some of these. Bill Parcells and people like that, and their family life is garbage. They get like no yeah. sleep. Their health is crap. And I'm like, I don't want to be like that. That's not me. And I don't think that that's necessary to be successful either. I think that's yeah, it's it's kind of the old school coaching, like yeah, almost yeah. dying for success. It is. It is. You don't and, need to do that. It's about being very efficient with the time that yeah. you have. Yeah. And I be think smart that a lot with of, the time you have on a right, daily. Right. Right. It's like people that look at like oh these streamers that stream Overwatch for. 12 hours a day you don't need to do that to become overwatch you don't need to do that you just need to be more efficient time like we said that four to six hour window now obviously there is a baseline i'm not saying you can play two hours a day expect to get overwatch league. there i think that if you want to become an overwatch league pro whether that's a coach or a player six to eight hours a day is like minimum right yeah. but if that out of those hours are hyper focused that's going to be better 10 times better than somebody who's spending twice as much time but half as efficient <clears throat> also, the off days that you guys have in a team, I think, d- don't touch the game at all. Just do something different. Yeah. It's so important to like reset your mind, uh, get your real life stuff yep. on yeah. point. Don't do Overwatch podcasts on your off day. Time, yeah. That's yeah. uh <laughs> Although I have to admit, I'm not great at that because I legitimately, like yesterday was, was, was an off day for me. And I was like, all right, I gotta watch some Overwatch League. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here like I've done everything, and, and I wanted to do it. But if you're gonna do it, make sure it's because you want to, not I mean, because you feel like. Yeah. It's there's there's two yeah. different modes. I mean, or at least I find that when I'm watching Overwatch League, I can watch it like, you know, I'm a fan, I love Overwatch, or I can watch it like I'm a coach, I really want to analyze what's going on. You yeah, know? it's a tryhard. And you sometimes you just watch it, and just like you know, what, dude, space, that that, that was awesome. What an amazing Genji Blade. You know, I don't really care about the decision making that led up to that, dude. That was sick. You know, like I really mm-hmm. wish I was a 4.8k Genji player. Um, yeah, four point. <laughs> right? Like, don't you? Yeah. You know, you wish you were number one, number one world, um, mm. and just and just enjoy the game for what it is, right? And sometimes you do have to do that. I think it's actually really important to sometimes come out of the coaching mindset and remember why you love Overwatch. You know? Yeah. And also, like, for if you need, if you think you're at a point where it's like a little bit too much, I guess your team, also your your staff, they will be supportive if you say, "Hey, man, I need two to three days." pause you know maybe maybe not on the highest level since the stakes are high there and you can't you should be an example and you should be capable of handling the pressure but if you're if you're a guy that's starting new or if you're in some mid-tier team if you need a break just do it it's better for your own health for your body and Mm -hmm. no one will will be mad about it because at the end of the day you are a better person when you come back you can you can better coach the players and you will there you will be there longer in the long run well like we say look after yourself you know you can't coach yeah, if you're not really looking after important. yourself um 
So uh, this is kind of on a tangent, but um, Kara asked, what do you think the optimal coaching setup is? Uh, for example, having, say, a tank coach, a DPS coach, and a support coach, or having a macro, micro, and an analyst, for instance. Do you have any preference as to how the setup is? So I think this has been said before. I don't think Overwatch has progressed. I don't know that it will ever progress to where you need a positional coach for two players, basically. So, like, I don't... Pins and I, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm not really one to say. So I'm sure there's some teams that might benefit from tank DPS and support. But honestly, at the Overwatch, even at the Overwatch League level, I don't think the game will ever progress to the level to where you need somebody who's literally all his job or her job is to just focus on support play. There's not enough to it. Like, like I, we're at a, at an academy level. Um, there is just me and the assistant coach, and we have like. Like just the things that we're seeing and solving and coaching, there's not necessarily a huge demand for a whole lot more staff. So for me, um, yeah, I could see tank DPS and support being fine. But honestly, if you're functioning anywhere at like a tier three or even a tier two level, you don't need more than one or like two or three. And you don't really want to split your it up coaches. like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I and, and I would be very hesitant to split up. Oh, you're only a tank coach because it, it's that's a tough thing to do. I will say this though. Um. Um. Yeah, it just comes down to what again to what you're better at. Like maybe you find somebody that's really good at the analytics work. Uh, those are few and far between. I will say that. <clears throat> um. That uh, like maybe you find a really good analyst. Use the analyst. Maybe you find somebody that happens to know like literally everything about Winston, right? But is not great at Ryan. Well, I mean, that's still useful if that happens to be what you guys are playing. So I don't. I wouldn't really put labels on it. I think trying to put labels on it is a mistake. Um, I think that's one of the differences between Overwatch or esports and normal sports. Is people like look at normal sports, and be like, oh, we have a quarterback coach or we have a forward coach. We need to have a coach. No, you don't. You don't. Every sport's different. Esports is different. Uh, you're talking about Overwatch, where you might have two players, um, and you you're going to be all you're going to be wasting your time going over like little bitty little bitty micro. It's not worth it. And I don't think positional coaches are a thing and should be a thing in Overwatch. Yeah. Do you think it could be the case when you like max out your roster, and it's like the standard? Every every team has like twelve. Like players a twelve and man. You literally have. Yeah. 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 Four four guys uh, on on the DPS. Four guys on tanks. Oh, four guys yeah, on support. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that could be the case. That could be the case. I just think of like when you think about something like and, and Josh and I'm talking about like in, in an American football quarterback, the m amount of drilling that's necessary, the amount of like micro physical body positioning and things like that. I yeah. just don't think we're there yet. And, Even if you um, only talk about the footwork, right? You can write a whole yeah. book just about the quarterback footwork. Yes, yes. So it's, to me, it's like drop step and so on. Exactly. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there. Like, I think you need to have somebody who has a level of knowledge about micro, um, whether that's your head coach, assistant coach, micro coach, whatever. But I don't think we're there to where a tank coach, the designated tank coach, is necessary yet. Um, yeah. Would you say having yes, a mental be, yeah. a mental health coach would be important? Sorry, I know this is. I didn't didn't mean to cut you up, Josh. If you want to carry on, you you finish what you were saying. No, no, go on, go on. Yeah, would you say having I mean, a mental health coach is important for yeah. any tier of play? Yeah, yeah, but again, it's like if we're being cynical about it, is it going to be worth the is it investment? Necessary. Mm. I yeah. mean, if you say mental health coach, do you actually mean a psychologist? Yeah, because they're two very different yeah. things, aren't they, right? Like a mental coach? I think a psychologist in the long run, I, and I'm just guessing because I never was in Overwatch League, neither an academy team that works closely with an Overwatch League team. But from my perspective, a psychologist there for the team that is there working the, the nine to five and the, able, the players are able to talk with this person, I think it's at some point a standard, I would say. Yeah. Well, it certainly is in other esports, right? In other esports, they all have yeah. psychologists because the mental game I mean, is so important. Yeah, there's there's some documentary out there from Australis. Yeah, how that's they exactly won, the uh, one I'm talking about. Yeah, and they, they literally, they when they were talking about why they succeed again after they failed big time they were literally giving all the credit to the to the psychologist yeah because it had such a big impact to like getting the pieces back together to build one unit to make sure players trusting each other mm -hmm. so i have two efficient. thoughts on this i think one i think at the first off 
before you get to the higher level um, where maybe that is part a part of the budget which even then it's a question mark uh, as a head coach that's something that you need to be putting effort into um, not necessarily go and get a psychology degree but understand mentality uh, understand how you like how you can build an environment where players can keep a healthy mental like we said whether it's taking yeah. care of themselves physically like positive re- reinforcement um, being encouraging being somebody they can trust uh, you know, making sure they have good ranked habits. I think those are all good ways of making sure that even if you don't have a sports psychologist or a mental health coach, that you can actually take care of your players for what you, I think head coach is a massive take a massive hand in that. Um, but also I think at the highest level, I think a lot of times it would be really beneficial for, for maybe not necessarily a nine to five sports psychologist, but have a sports psychologist that you guys have like under, contract like hey listen we're gonna can you guys set us a good rate for us like once a week we're gonna have the team players come down and talk with you and, and sort things out and you know, have like that maybe not a not like a hsl psychologist but a psychologist that hsl uses if that makes sense yeah, yeah. um something that you guys can trust to kind of keep the players mental and all set and help them do understand things because sports psychology is a relatively do you useful. think uh, as we're already in that like healthy lifestyle making sure players are, are good. Do you think a personal trainer or even like a nutritionist on the highest level, it's nowadays, especially with the, with the fly schedule and the international home stands, do you think it's necessary? When you had the ability to get these people, would you get them? Yes, I would. I mean, I don't know that I would have a, a both. I mean, maybe not for I... you as a, um, what's it called? A personal trainer, since no. you probably can handle that yourself, right? Making yeah. the correct schedule. But as, as a person that doesn't have that background and needs kind of a professional, yes, keeps the player on track. Yeah, I think so it would be crucial. You say so, okay. Yeah, I, I, I think, think like really yeah, having like a like like a nutritionist slash cook and maybe a personal trainer or something uh, something along those lines. Even just one of those would yeah. be immensely useful. Like you said, the, the the travel time and things like that. Like that's gonna that's gonna that's going to have a toll on players, right? And being able to mitigate the damage being done. Um, yeah, I think even really, preparing really, really... them for the long flights and or what what exercises they can do in their in their hotel mm-hmm. room or like whenever they are in a park together doing doing team activities, just yep. for the sake of it that your that your player are prepared for that for that like long season and keeping keeping themselves uh, on a high level that they can still play agree um okay i'm just moving down the list because we're getting close to close to time here um we've got like another 15 minutes if we're sticking if we're sticking precisely to the uh, two hour mark but i guess it depends how we're going um how important would you say as a coach it is to maintain a broad set of skills as in like being able to coach macro being able to coach micro being able to coach I don't know, tanks, DPS, and support, for instance. Um, uh, maybe doing analysis as well. Coaching mentality things. How important would you say it is to be be able to do all of those things or uh, maybe specialize in one of them? Um, what, what's your what's your take on that? I mean, as a head coach or is it... just a, Well, I mean, just in general. I, I didn't specify. Maybe as a head coach. Uh, um... I think that like it's important, even as an assistant coach, like we can kind of make fun of nerdy analysts and things like that, but... In all actuality, you you need to have some level of communicational skill, no matter what coaching branch you want to go into. Strategic analytics is it like I know of some people that have like, oh, I'm um, she's they're really intense analysts, but they can't communicate their ideas. I have no idea what their conclusions are, so it's a complete waste, right? So it doesn't matter what skill set that you you want to specify in, you need to be decent at communicating. I think that's yeah. important. But again, it comes down to what you really enjoy. Right. I think um, what you enjoy is going to be a lot easier to specialize in. And then maybe you have to eat your vegetables a little bit. So for me, um, I love leadership and and macro and stuff like that. But I still need to have a competent micro because I want to continue to be able to take leadership with the one on one players. Because I need to be decent at one on one. Right. So I think I think it's like um, maintaining a relative a relatively broad skill set is is important. Um, but it is totally fine to specialize just as long as you have at least some baseline. And then again, it comes down to also like reading the table and receiving criticism. So like if I'm a micro coach, but my, my head coach is like, Hey, listen, like your, your, your plans are too detailed. 
I like, I don't like this. These ideas are too niche. Like I need you to be, and then they take the criticism. If I'm a head coach and I'm all about like taking lead and taking charge, but I'm like clueless when it comes to macro and it's hurting my scrim feedback quality, that needs to be addressed then. Right. So you just kind of, it's, it's, it depends on the situation and also depends on the person, but be very receptive to like, if it, you think your mis or uh, inexperience in a certain aspect is affecting how you do your job, then it needs to be addressed. Like mm -hmm. if you're a, a more example, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a DPS coach, okay, but you don't know how the DPS are supposed to play in a composition. Like if you're trying to coach McCree May and you know every little May McCree trick, but you don't know how the McCree and May are supposed to play in that comp, you need to shave up on your micro because it's affecting how you're coaching. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. I think it's like you say, having touched at least a little bit on everything, um, but. You, you need to be able to sell yourself as a coach, right? And if you're not really good at one, if you're not really good at something, uh, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you, do you have any take on that, Josh? Anything you want to add? I think what Spelo said, uh, completely agree. Mm. Because it's kind as of long, thing. It doesn't matter what you do at the end in communication, it's key. Uh, thanks for the follow, Temporal. Um, Okay, yeah, we're we're all, we're getting down the list. There's only two more, two more, two more questions that we had pre-written, and then two more outside questions. Sweet. Um, is it okay to blindly copy our slash contenders? Just like, oh, you yeah. know what? They played this comp. Just go for it. I mean, is it okay? Oh, you know what? Like, They've got Haxal yeah. on Genji. Uh, we'll just we'll just play dive. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is such a bait question. You know the answer is, is gonna be no. Yeah. obviously it's not okay but you know overwatch league plays it for two reasons one because the heroes are strong and two probably more importantly because the heroes work well together so you know just because you see in overwatch league hey may is really good well then why is may really good so like to me it's like sure copy overwatch league compositions if you want to contenders compositions go for it like clockwork vendetta everybody did that with clockwork everyone vendetta. did it everybody yeah, did yeah, it yeah. With goats yeah. everybody did it but you need you do need to go a step further and be like okay then why and also how like how does it work okay is it work because of pull hooks does it work because uh, it has a lot of survivability right now with McCree May why are people playing McCree May right now obviously May is strong Eva's strong um, Lucio is still or Brig is still relatively strong so those are obviously strong heroes but what does the composition exactly want to do in mirrors and against DPS spam so it doesn't have to be a very complicated understanding of it you could just kind of go huh. They're maywalling and then they're doing this, or oh, huh, they're playing around this position, or okay, when they're they play to build it, this ultimate, comp. yeah, right. So you just you could just you don't have to be a genius. Yeah. You just kind of take the time to look at it and figure it out. Um, I think one thing I will say that's slightly off tangent, but on that similar vein of thought, is that it's more important for most teams to play to their strengths. Uh, than it is to just blindly copy. So yes. if your team has a really good McCree May and, and you, or you guys are competent in those heroes, sure, go for it. Uh, but if you guys legitimately have a Winston one trick, don't play. It's as simple play as that, isn't strength. it? Right? Don't, if you don't, got don't, don't don't yeah yeah if, you, if you're Clockwork Vendetta and you've got six you've got someone that's literally four point six k on Torb without trying, um, <laughs> then you're gonna play Torb, yeah. right? It's, it's just a, it's just it's right. just as simple as that, right? Um, right. and, and I'm still, I'm still mad. I'm still mad about Clockwork Vendetta. Like, oh yeah, I, I guess too. every every single coach, when Contender started, said, ah, they they don't win a single freaking game, and they did, they did fucking well. And I ask myself, how man, you're you're in Contenders. Here's and, and so why. They didn't even bother to kind of make something uh, counterable to it. They just run straight goats to it. And I was like, guys, what the fuck? Yeah. I mean, it just comes down to the team has worked really well together. Like the comp obviously had a, had a strategy behind it, but yeah. it just worked really well together. And mm -hmm. as any head coach knows, like you can make a suboptimal comp work if you guys are if you guys have good synergy. Do you guys have practiced together a lot? That's yeah, all there sure, is. Yeah, for me, I'm just getting a little bit mad because not many teams tried really to to break down the composition to kind of figure out to it. beat it. Yeah. How yeah, do we yeah, play? Yeah. How do we need to play to win this? To our mm -hmm. strengths. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still proud that HSL was the only team beating him twice. And Giganti, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Every other team wasn't able. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what they did, it was a tremendously runner and big, big respect to them for like pulling yep. this off in the first place. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Last couple of questions. Oh, no. Red games. My team runs number a lot. Randy. Oh, it's nuts. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just playing to your strengths, right? Like we said. If you've got someone that's a crazy Doomfist, you play Doomfist, right? you got a crazy Reaper, play Reaper. If you your, your main support can't play Lucio, you're not going to play the many Lucio comps, right? It's just as simple as yep. that. Playing yeah. playing we to your team strengths. A plus, right? Yeah. If we would have Sparkly in our team, we'd probably 100% run more Doomfist. Right? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I've done it in the past too, you know? I've said, you know what, like... You're you're okay at May, um, but your hands are yeah. way better. We'll we'll figure out some composition that works around it, right? Um, especially with the current patch, it's I think it's such a blessing to see the game on such a healthy state that so multiple things can work. Yeah, I mean yeah. yesterday, no, much like you you have seen um, people play Tanso, Hans was it Tanso Kree or Hanso May? I can't remember, but that was the first time I've seen that combo for Hanso. And I'm, I'm still like, <laughs> I think. We still have to figure out so much about the current patch. And yeah, you can really play to your strength. If you have a player that, that's really, really good on a certain hero, just put it on that hero and play around it, in my yeah. opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Unless you're a team like Uprising Academy, who might have a player that's just bad at every hero. Not oh, saying names. Just but screwed. It's, yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not saying names, but it's lethal. So <clears throat> I'm well familiar with how lethal is, how bad he is at everything. So. <laughs> I've seen him on semen and seen him in EU, seen him around throwing. Yeah, yeah. Little, AK <laughs> Dennis the Swag. <laughs> um, okay, last couple of questions. So how how do higher level teams like tier one, tier two scout or recruit for coaches? Um, there aren't usually any looking for coach posts, right? So how do you how do you make that step? How do you talk how do you get into conversation with these kind of people? How do you how do you make that jump, right? Um, okay. And you kind of Pardon touched on this friend. at the front, right? You did start. You just yeah, said yeah, yeah. at the front. At Pardon the my French, but balls. <laughs> uh, you got to message people. You got it. You got to just screw it and say like, I want to message people and see if they want the spot. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, and then just time and experience. Like, I would say I got a couple of. I know a couple of my trials went better because I had like that first fight concept series that I did last Overwatch League season. So there's a little bit of content to back it up. But the majority was just like, you know what, reach out to teams, let me do a VOD review for you guys, see if I'm garbage, you know? Uh, and that's, that's going to work all the way up to the Tier 2 level. And then at like the Tier 1 level, um, I don't know. I know that you could reach out to Overwatch League teams, but at this point, I'm like right on the cusp, and I don't know yet. We'll find out. You know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, that's my goal. Uh, obviously, I want to be as successful as I can with Uprising Academy, but I don't want to be here forever. Right now, this is still an immense challenge working with the Academy team. Um... The players are really good. The competition is really good, and I'm learning a lot every single week. So I'm I'm happy with where I'm at right now. But down the road, maybe we move up to the next step, and I'll find out how I got there. But I imagine it'll be because of what I did at the academy level in terms of making myself as best as a coach as I could possibly uh, be, communicating well, working on my personal coaching. And I got here because of my unsigned North American contenders performance, which was doing like coaching as best as I could, giving as much leadership as best as I can, making the best of the players that I had. And I got to that level because I worked with the tier three team, you know, and made that as best as I could. And I got there because the master's team. So just, just one step at a time, like get, when you get like, if you're in a tier three coach, get to tier two. Coach to tier two. Try out for a tier two team. If you're tier two, try out for academy. Reach out to academy. If you're in academy, try out for Overwatch League, right? And and, and at that point, it's like it's more about um, being relentless on your self focus, right? And contacting as many teams and organizations as you can. Then it is about just hoping that you draw the lucky. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um. Okay. Yeah. Follow. Follow. Follow on question. What do you have on your resume? And. Uh... Because because it's something I, I mean I don't know if this is something you come across maybe you haven't um but when you're like when you approach these guys do you say look here's my resume or do you just say yo I'll do a review for you um mm, I do share my resume let me see if I can find it as an example um yeah here we go you can post it in the chat or you can yeah I'll I'll, I'll you post it in, have a... you post it in the chat because otherwise I have to minimize you and show yeah, yeah show yeah, all yeah, our yeah. naughty messages that we've had before I'll this. have to I'll... I'll have to upload uh, this, but yeah, it has my my body fat percentage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your B, your BMI, yeah. She's like, yeah, I can I could do a ten minute mile, or yeah, whatever yeah, it is, a ten minute fine. mile, no, a one minute mile I even. Can, I can easily easily throw around players if they get out of hand. Yeah, but for for yourself, do you think a good resume 
it's important to have. Yes, I think it's important to have. I think it's mostly not, doesn't have to be the most professional looking document in the world, but honestly, it's not that hard to make a decent looking uh, resume. Mine isn't really that fancy. It's just what I had and that was yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, and the content in it, it's the important part. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me upload it. Yeah, I mean, if you if you put it on, or you copy it to Google Docs, you can post the link in the chat. Yeah. Um, what I can say about resumes, at least, make sure it's up to date because uh, yes. with, the, with the tier three academy team and even with the containers team, I've I've went through so many applications, and one thing I've seen over and over again is a guy linking a what from from early yeah. meta where Moira was played or sent, and I was like, okay, and I still don't don't know. <laughs> How you mm -hmm. currently coach the meta, whatever the meta is at this point, you know, it's mm -hmm. so important to keep that up to date, to make sure you you uh, you have your latest team in there, your reference. Also, make sure that your references know that you have them on references. Like, just make sure your your resume, it's waterproof. Mm -hmm. It's it's really important for me when I go through these resumes. I can't figure out how to do it, unfortunately. And also, one thing, never lie on these resumes because sooner or later... People do that? Yeah, people do that. Oh, think... oh boy. Well, uh, not, not yeah, there's one particular case. But you know, they're, seen... they're boosting it a little bit. Yeah. So, oh yeah, tier, loads of tier 2 experience. And uh, they've like had a couple of scrims of tier 2. Mm. Or, you, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. Um, when yeah, they really uh, stretch the, the resume, truth. And I see something, it always already throws me a little bit off, you know. I already have something in my mind that tells me, ah, I don't know. Even if it if it would be a good coach and you have another guy that maybe has the same skill set, but his resume, it's clean, it's it's up to date. And yeah. Well, it just shows that you put effort into it. That's pretty yeah. that's that's the important thing. So let me see if I can shareable link. I'm not gonna let anybody edit this because <laughs> What? It says that he is like, has a big butt. Who would put that in the resume? <laughs> Hang on a second. That wasn't there before. Yeah. That might work. Nice. So if anyone wants, to, I'm going to take a look at that later um, after after we're done. Um, yeah. Completed high school is the first thing on the list. Final nice. question from Overwatch educators. What are some of the biggest things you're learning right now that are making the biggest difference? God, that's a broad question. Yeah. What is your favorite food in the whole entire world? That's an, that's an easier question. I, I don't know. Like some things that are learning right now that are making the biggest difference. I think the big thing that I'm learning right now is like continuing to be self-critical about how I'm handling the review process and how I'm handling the teaching slash scrimmage process. I think that's something that's going to continue to be tumultuous for me uh, for years. I think I was talking about this with Josh and like the two biggest differences between coaching sports and esports is one – as an esports coach, especially when you get started for a little while, you're basically just a volunteer. You don't have any serious like power, I guess, and that was that's obviously hard to learn. But also, the second thing is is how do I like people in esports? You scrimmage. That's what you do. You don't do drills. You don't practice this and practice handoffs and kicking and passing and shooting the ball. No, it it's just scrimmages. That's all you do. So being able to find out how to make scrimmaging a good training environment what's the most efficient way to make it a good training environment that is a huge challenge so for me it's learning how to be effective and efficient scrimmage and review time for me also basically self-reflecting self-reflecting yeah always yeah. always learning no matter how good you are right yeah absolutely yeah. and on that note I all of these questions at some point yeah they're boiling down to to two to three simple things yeah work hard Work hard, work smart. Uh, and yep, on that note, I understand. I understand you. Uh, you have places to go, busy man, Speedy. Yes, so uh, I'll. I'm just gonna put everyone's. Uh, I'll just post your your Twitter link in the chat and Josh's. Okay. Great. So uh, everyone can follow Spilo at at Coach Spilo. Um, anything else you want to share? Any closing closing remarks before before we <clears> wrap up? Um. Think um, I would say I would say like like if you're a, if you're a low tier coach like working your way up through the ladder, be patient, be patient, be consistent, be sustainable with what you're doing. Um, it's hard, hard work if you're doing it right. It is hard work, and I very well understand. I'm sure as Aplox and Josh do as well. So hang in there. Um, it's a, quite often a very thankless job for a long time. 
but uh, be patient and work hard. Yeah, um, thank you everyone for being here. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions, um, you're very welcome to, to hit me up and I put my Discord link in the chat. And uh, I'm sure Spilo's happy to, if he has time, answer anyone's questions if, uh, if you drop him a DM too on Discord. Sure, um, absolutely. Yeah, so thank you for being here, everyone. And uh, thank you. We'll uh, we'll see everyone around. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Apex. Bye.